Section 16 of Our National Parks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our National Parks by John Muir. Chapter 8, Part 2 The Fountains and Streams of the Yosemite National Park. A Mountain Stream in June, Merced Creek and Vernal Falls, Yosemite. About the same may be said of the spring gladness of blood when the red streams surge and sing in accord with the swelling plants and rivers, inclining animals and everybody to travel in hurrahing crowds like floods, while exhilarating melody and color and fragrance, form and motion, flows to the heart through all the quickening senses. In early summer the streams are in bright prime, running crystal clear, deep and full, but not overflowing their banks. About as deep through the night as the day, the variations so marked in spring being now too slight to be noticed. Nearly all the weather is cloudless sunshine, and everything is at its brightest. Lake, river, garden, and forest, all with their warm, throbbing life. Most of the plants are in full leaf and flower. The blessed oozels have built their mossy huts, and are now singing their sweetest song on spray-sprinkled ledges beside the waterfalls. In tranquil, mellow autumn, when the year's work is about done, when the fruits are ripe, birds and seeds out of their nests, and all the landscape is glowing like a benevolent countenance at rest, then the streams are at their lowest ebb, their wild rejoicing soothed to thoughtful calm. All the smaller tributaries whose branches do not reach back to the perennial fountains of the summit peaks shrink to whispering, trinkling currents. The snow of their basins gone, they are now fed only by small moraine springs, whose waters are mostly evaporated in passing over warm pavements and in feeling their way from pool to pool through the midst of boulders and sand. Even the main streams are so low they may be easily forded, and their grand falls and cascades, now gentle and approachable, have waned to sheets and webs of embroidery, falling fold over fold in new and ever-changing beauty. Two of the most songful of the rivers, the Tuolumne and Merced, water nearly all the park, spreading their branches far and wide like broad-headed oaks, and the highest branches of each draw their sources from one and the same foundation on Mount Lyle, at an elevation of about 13,000 feet above the sea. The crest of the mountain, against which the head of the glacier rests, is worn to a thin blade full of joints, through which a part of the glacial water flows southward, giving rise to the highest trickling affluence of the Merced, while the main drainage, flowing northward, gives rise to those of the Tuolumne. After diverging for a distance of ten or twelve miles, these twin rivers flow in a general westerly direction, descending rapidly for the first thirty miles, and then rushing in glorious apron cascades and falls from one Yosemite valley to another. Below the Yosemites, they descend in gray rapids and swirling, swaying reaches through the chaparral-clad canyons of the foothills and across the golden California plain, to their confluence with the San Joaquin, where after all their long wanderings, they are only about ten miles apart. The main canyons are from fifty to seventy miles long, and from two to four thousand feet deep, carved in the solid flank of the range. Though rough in some places and hard to travel, they are the most delightful of roads, leading through the grandest scenery, full of life and motion, and offering most telling lessons in earth sculpture. The walls, far from being unbroken featureless cliffs, seem like ranges of separate mountains, so deep and varied is their sculpture, rising in lordly domes, towers, round-browed outstanding headlands, and clustering spires with dark shadowy side canyons between. But, however wonderful in height and mass and fineness of finish, no anomalous curiosities are presented, no freaks of nature. All stand related in delicate rhythm, a grand glacial rock song. Among the interesting and influential of the secondary features of the canyon scenery are the great avalanche taluses that lean against the walls at intervals of a mile or two. In the middle of Yosemite region, they are usually from three to five hundred feet high, 
and are made up of huge, angular, well-preserved, unshifting boulders, overgrown with gray lichens, tree shrubs, and delicate flowering plants. Some of the largest of the boulders are forty or fifty feet cube, weighing from five to ten thousand tons, and where the cleavage joints of the granite are exceptionally wide, apart a few blocks may be found nearly a hundred feet in diameter. These wonderful boulder piles are distributed throughout all the canyons of the range, completely choking them in some of the narrower portions, and no mountaineer will be likely to forget the savage roughness of the roads they make. Even the swift overbearing rivers, accustomed to sweep everything out of their way, are in some places bridled and held in check by them foaming, roaring, and glorious majesty of flood, rushing off long, rumbling trains of ponderous blocks without apparent effort, they are not able to move the largest, which, withstanding all assaults for centuries, are left at rest in the channels like islands, with gardens on their tops, fringed with foam below, with flowers above. A Sierra Canyon, Kings River Canyon from Lookout Peak on some points concerning the origin of these Toulouses I was long in doubt. Plainly enough, they were derived from the cliffs above them, the size of each talus being approximately measured by a scar on the wall, the rough, angular surface of which contrasts with the rounded, glaciated, unfractured parts. I saw also that, instead of being slowly accumulated material, weathered off, boulder by boulder, in the ordinary way, Almost every talus had been formed suddenly in a single avalanche and had not been increased in size during the last three or four centuries. For trees three or four hundred years old were growing on them, some standing at the top close to the wall, without a bruise or broken branch showing that scarcely a single boulder had fallen among them since they were planted. Furthermore, all the taluses throughout the range seemed, by the trees and lichens growing on them, to be of the same age. All the phenomena pointed straight to a grand ancient earthquake. But I left the question open for years, and went on from canyon to canyon, observing again and again, measuring the heights of taluses throughout the range on both flanks, and the variations in the angles of their surface slopes, studying the way their boulders were assorted and related and brought to rest, and the cleavage joints of the cliffs from whence they were derived, cautious about making up my mind. Only after I had seen one made did all doubt as to their formation vanish. In Yosemite Valley, one morning about two o'clock, I was aroused by an earthquake, and though I had never before enjoyed a storm of this sort, the strange, wild, thrilling motion and rumbling could not be mistaken and I ran out of my cabin near the sentinel rock, both glad and frightened, shouting, A noble earthquake! Feeling sure I was going to learn something. The shocks were so violent and varied and succeeded one another so closely, one had to balance in walking as if on the deck of a ship among the waves, and it seemed impossible the high cliffs should escape being shattered. In particular, I feared that the sheer-fronted sentinel rock, which rises to a height of 3,000 feet, would be shaken down, and I took shelter back of a big pine, hoping I might be protected from outbounding boulders should any come so far. I was now convinced that an earthquake had been the maker of the taluses, and positive proof soon came. It was a calm moonlight night, and no sound was heard for the first minute or two save a low muffled underground rumbling and a slight rustling of the agitated trees, as if in wrestling with the mountains nature were holding her breath. Then suddenly out of the strange silence and strange motion there came a tremendous roar. The Eagle Rock, a short distance up the valley, had given way, and I saw it falling in thousands of the great boulders I had been studying so long, pouring to the valley floor in a free curve luminous from friction, making a terribly sublime and beautiful spectacle, an arc of the fifteen hundred feet span as true in form and as steady as a rainbow in the midst of the stupendous roaring rock storm. The sound was 
inconceivably deep and broad and earnest, as if the whole earth, like a living creature, had at last found a voice and were calling to her sister planets. It seemed to me that if all the thunder I ever heard were condensed into one roar, it would not equal this rock roar at the birth of a mountain talus. Think, then, of the roar that arose to heaven when all the thousands of ancient canyon taluses throughout the length and breadth of the range were simultaneously given birth. The main storm was soon over, and, eager to see the newborn talus, I ran up the valley in the moonlight and climbed it before the huge blocks after their wild, fiery flight had come to complete rest. They were slowly settling into their places, chafing, grating against one another, groaning and whispering, but no motion was visible except in a stream of small fragments pattering down the face of the cliff at the head of the talus. A cloud of dust particles, the smallest of the boulders, floated out across the whole breadth of the valley and formed a ceiling that lasted until after sunrise and the air was loaded with the odor of crushed Douglas spruces from a grove that had been mowed down and mashed like weeds. Sauntering about to see what other changes had been made, I found the Indians in the middle of the valley, terribly frightened, of course, fearing the angry spirits of the rocks were trying to kill them. The few whites wintering in the valley were assembled in front of the old Hutchings Hotel, comparing notes and meditating flight to steadier ground seemingly as sorely frightened as the Indians. It is always interesting to see people in dead earnest from whatever cause, and earthquakes make everybody earnest. Shortly after sunrise, a low, blunt, muffled rumbling like distant thunder was followed by another series of shocks, which, though not nearly so severe as the first, made the cliffs and domes tremble like jelly, and the big pines and oaks thrill and swish and wave their branches with startling effect. Then the groups of talkers were suddenly hushed, and the solemnity of their faces was sublime. One in particular of these winter neighbors, a rather thoughtful, speculative man with whom I had often conversed, was a firm believer in the cataclysmic origin of the valley, and I now jokingly remarked that his wild tumble-down and engulfment hypothesis might soon be proved, since these underground rumblings and shakings might be the forerunners of another Yosemite-making cataclysm, which would perhaps double the depth of the valley by swallowing the floor, leaving the ends of the wagon roads and trails three or four thousand feet in the air. Just then came a second series of shocks, and it was fine to see how awfully silent and solemn he became. His belief in the existence of a mysterious abyss into which the suspended floor of the valley and all the domes and battlements of the walls might at any moment go roaring down mightily troubled him. To cheer and tease him into another view of the case, I said, Come, cheer up, smile a little and clap your hands now that kind Mother Earth is trotting us on her knee to amuse us and make us good but the well-meant joke seemed irreverent and utterly failed, as if only prayerful terror could rightly belong to the wild beauty-making business. Even after all the heavier shocks were over, I could do nothing to reassure him. On the contrary, he handed me the keys of his little store and, with a companion of like mind, fled to the lowlands. In about a month he returned, but a sharp shock occurred that very day which sent him flying again. The rocks trembled more or less every day for over two months, and I kept a bucket of water on my table to learn what I could of the movements. The blunt thunder tones in the depths of the mountains were usually followed by sudden jarring, horizontal thrusts from the northward, often succeeded by twisting, upjolting movements. Judging by its effects, this Yosemite, or Inyo earthquake, as it is sometimes called, was gentle as compared to the other one that gave rise to the Grand Talus system of the range and did so much for the canyon scenery. Nature, usually so deliberate in her operations, then created, as we have seen, a new set of features simply by giving the mountains a shake, changing not only the high peaks and cliffs, but the streams. As soon as these rock avalanches fell, every stream began to sing new songs, 
for in many places thousands of boulders were hurled into their channels, roughening and half-dimming them, compelling the waters to surge and roar in rapids where before they were gliding smoothly. Some of the streams were completely dammed, driftwood, leaves, etc., filling the interstices between the boulders, thus giving rise to lakes and level reaches, and these again, after being gradually filled in, to smooth meadows through which the streams now silently meander, while at the same time some of the taluses took their places of old meadows and groves. Thus rough places were made smooth, and smooth places rough. But on the whole, by what at first sight seemed pure confusion and ruin, the landscapes were enriched, for gradually every talus, however big the boulders composing it, was covered with groves and gardens, and made a finely proportioned and ornamental base for the sheer cliffs. In this beauty work, every boulder is prepared and measured and put in its place more thoughtfully than are the stones of temples. If for a moment you are inclined to regard these taluses as mere draggled, chaotic dumps, climb to the top of one of them, tie your mountain shoes firmly over the instep, and with braced nerves, run down without any haggling, puttering hesitation, boldly jumping from boulder to boulder with even speed. You will then find your feet playing a tune and quickly discover the music and poetry of rock piles. A fine lesson. And all nature's wildness tells the same story. Storms of every sort, torrents, earthquakes, cataclysms, convulsions of nature, etc., however mysterious and lawless at first sight they may seem, are only harmonious notes in the song of creation, varied expressions of God's love. End of section 16 Section 17 of Our National Parks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Our National Parks by John Muir Chapter 9, Part 1 The Sequoia and General Grant National Parks the big tree, Sequoia gigantea, is nature's forest masterpiece, and so far as I know, the greatest of living things. It belongs to an ancient stock, as its remains in old rocks show, and has a strange air of other days about it, a thoroughbred look inherited from the long ago, the old lang syne of trees. Once the genus was common, and with many species flourished in the now desolate Arctic regions, in the interior of North America and in Europe, but in long eventful wanderings from climate to climate, only two species have survived the hardships they had to encounter, the Gigantia and the Sempervirens, the former now restricted to the western slopes of the Sierra, the other to the coast mountains, and both to California, excepting a few groves of redwood which extend into Oregon. The Pacific coast in general is the paradise of conifers. Here nearly all of them are giants, and display a beauty and magnificence unknown elsewhere. The climate is mild, the ground never freezes, the moisture and sunshine abound all the year. Nevertheless, it is not easy to account for the colossal size of the sequoias. The largest are about 300 feet high and 30 feet in diameter. Who, of all the dwellers of the plains and prairies and fertile home forests of round-headed oak and maple, hickory and elm, ever dreamed that earth could bear such growths? Trees that the familiar pines and firs seem to know nothing about, lonely, silent, serene, with the physiognomy almost godlike, and so old. Thousands of them still living had already counted their years by tens of centuries when Columbus set sail from Spain, and were in their vigor of youth or middle age when the star led the Chaldean sages to the infant Savior's cradle. As far as man is concerned, they are the same yesterday, today, and forever emblems of permanence. 
no description can give an adequate idea of their singular majesty much less their beauty excepting the sugar pine most of their neighbors with pointed tops seem to be forever shouting excelsior while the big tree though soaring above them all seems satisfied its rounded head poised lightly as a cloud giving no impression of trying to go higher only in youth does it show like other conifers a heavenward yearning keenly aspiring with a long quick growing top indeed the whole tree for the first century or two or until a hundred to a hundred and fifty feet high is arrowhead in form and compared with the solemn rigidity of age is as sensitive to the wind as a squirrel tail the lower branches are gradually dropped as it grows older and the upper ones thinned out until comparatively few are left these however are developed to a great size divide again and again and terminate in bossy rounded masses of leafy branchlets while the head becomes dome-shaped then poised in fullness of strength and beauty stern and solemn and mean it glows with eager enthusiastic life quivering to the tip of every leaf and branch and far-reaching root calm as a granite dome the first to feel the touch of the rosy beams of the morning the last to bid the sun good night perfect specimens unhurt by running fires or lightning are singularly regular and symmetrical in general form though not at all conventional showing infinite variety in sure unity and harmony of plan the immensely strong stately shafts with rich purplish-brown bark are free of limbs for a hundred and fifty feet or so though dense tufts of sprays occur here and there producing an ornamental effect while long parallel furrows give a fluted columnar appearance it shoots forth its limbs with equal boldness in every direction showing no weather side on the old trees the main branches are crooked and rugged and strike rigidly outward mostly at right angles from the trunk but there is always a certain measured restraint in their reach which keeps them within bounds no other sierra tree has foliage so densely massed or outline so finely firmly drawn and so obediently subordinate to an ideal type a particularly knotty angular ungovernable looking branch five to eight feet in diameter and perhaps a thousand years old may occasionally be seen pushing out from the trunk as if determined to break across the bounds of the regular curve but like all the others as soon as the general outline is approached the huge limb dissolves into massy bosses of branchlets and sprays as if the tree were growing beneath an invisible bell glass against the sides of which the branches were moulded while many small varied departures from the ideal form give the impression of freedom to grow as they like except in picturesque old age after being struck by lightning and broken by a thousand snowstorms this regularity of form is one of the big tree's most distinguishing characteristics another is the simple sculptural beauty of the trunk and its great thickness as compared with its height and the width of its branches many of them being from eight to ten feet in diameter at a height of two hundred feet from the ground and seeming more like finely modelled and sculptured architectural columns than the stems of trees while the great strong limbs are like rafters supporting the magnificent dome head the root system corresponds in magnitude with the other dimensions of the tree forming a flat far-reaching spongy network two hundred feet or more in width without any taproot and the instep is so grand and fine so suggestive of endless strength it is long ere the eye is released to look above it the natural swell of the roots though at first sight excessive gives rise to buttresses no greater than are required for beauty as well as strength as at once appears when you stand back far enough to see the whole tree in its true proportions the fineness of the taper of the trunk is shown by its thickness at great heights a diameter of ten feet at a height of two hundred being as we have seen not uncommon indeed the boles of but few trees hold their thickness as well as sequoia 
resolute consummate determined in form always beheld with wondering admiration the big tree always seems unfamiliar standing alone unrelated with peculiar physiognomy awfully solemn and earnest nevertheless there is nothing alien in its looks the madrona clad in thin smooth red and yellow bark and big glossy leaves seems in the dark coniferous forests of washington and vancouver island like some lost wanderer from the magnolia groves of the south while the sequoia with all its strangeness seems more at home than any of its neighbors holding the best right to the ground as the oldest strongest inhabitant one soon becomes acquainted with new species of pine and fir spruce as with friendly people shaking their outstretched branches like shaking hands and fondling their beautiful little ones while the venerable aboriginal sequoia ancient of other days keeps you at a distance taking no notice of you speaking only to the winds thinking only of the sky looking as strange in aspect and behavior among the neighboring trees as would a mastodon or a hairy elephant among the homely bears and deer only the sierra juniper is at all like it standing rigid and unconquerable on glacial pavements for thousands of years grim rusty silent uncommunicative with an air of antiquity about as pronounced as that so characteristic of sequoia the bark of full-grown trees is from one to two feet thick rich cinnamon brown purplish on young trees and shady parts of the old forming magnificent masses of color with the underbrush and beds of flowers toward the end of winter the trees themselves bloom while the snow is still eight or ten feet deep the pistillate flowers are about three-eighths of an inch long pale green and grow in countless thousands on the ends of the sprays the staminate are still more abundant pale yellow a fourth of an inch long and when the golden pollen is ripe they color the whole tree and dust the air and the ground far and near the cones are bright grass green in color about two and a half inches long one and a half wide and are made up of thirty or forty strong closely packed rhomboidal scales with four to eight seeds at the base of each the seeds are extremely small and light being only from an eighth to a fourth of an inch long and wide including a filmy surrounding wing which causes them to glint and waver in falling and enables the wind to carry them considerable distances from the tree the faint lisp of snowflakes as they alight is one of the smallest sounds mortal can hear the sound of falling sequoia seeds even when they happen to strike on flat leaves or flakes of bark is about as faint very different is the bumping and thudding of the falling cones most of them are cut off by the douglas squirrel and stored for the sake of the seeds small as they are in the calm indian summer these busy harvesters with ivory sickles go to work early in the morning as soon as breakfast is over and nearly all day the ripe cones fall in a steady pattering bumping shower unless harvested in this way they discharge their seeds and remain on the tree for many years in fruitful seasons the trees are fairly laden on two small specimen branches one and a half and two inches in diameter i counted four hundred and eighty cones no other california conifer produces nearly so many seeds excepting perhaps its relative the redwood of the coast mountains millions are ripened annually by a single tree and the product of one of the main groves in a fruitful year would suffice to plant all the mountain ranges of the world the dense tufted sprays make snug nesting places for birds and in some of the loftiest leafiest towers of verdu thousands of generations have been reared the great solemn trees shedding off flocks of merry singers every year from nests like the flocks of winged seeds from the cones the big tree keeps its youth far longer than any of its neighbors 
most silver firs are old in their second and third centuries pines in their fourth or fifth while the big tree growing beside them is still in the bloom of its youth juvenile in every feature at the age of old pines and cannot be said to attain anything like prime size and beauty before its fifteen hundredth year or under favourable circumstances become old before its three thousandth many no doubt are much older than this on one of the king's river giants thirty-five feet and eight inches in diameter exclusive of bark i counted upwards of four thousand annual wood rings in which there was no trace of decay after all these centuries of mountain weather there is no absolute limit to the existence of any tree their death is due to accidents not as of animals to the wearing out of organs only the leaves die of old age their fall is foretold in their structure but the leaves are renewed every year and so also are the other essential organs wood roots bark buds most of the sierra trees die of disease thus the magnificent silver firs are devoured by fungi and comparatively few of them live to see their three hundredth birth year but nothing hurts the big trees i never saw one that was sick or showed the slightest sign of decay it lives on through indefinite thousands of years until burned blown down undermined or shattered by some tremendous lightning stroke no ordinary bolt ever seriously hurts sequoia in all my walks i have seen only one that was thus killed outright lightning though rare in the california lowlands is common on the sierra almost every day in june and july small thunderstorms refresh the main forest belt clouds like snowy mountains of marvellous beauty grow rapidly in the calm sky about midday and cast cooling shadows and showers that seldom last more than an hour nevertheless these brief kind storms wound or kill a good many trees i have seen silver firs two hundred feet high split into long peeled rails and slivers down to the roots leaving not even a stump the rails radiating like the spokes of a wheel from a hole in the ground where the tree stood but the sequoia instead of being split and slivered usually has forty or fifty feet of its brash knotty top smashed off in short chunks about the size of cord wood the beautiful rosy red ruins covering the ground in a circle a hundred feet wide or more i never saw any that had been cut down to the ground or even to below the branches except one in the stanislaus grove about twelve feet in diameter the greater part of which was smashed to fragments leaving only a leafless stump about seventy-five feet high it is a curious fact that all the very old sequoias have lost their heads by lightning all things come to him who waits but of all living things sequoia is perhaps the only one able to wait long enough to make sure of being struck by lightning thousands of years it stands ready and waiting offering its head to every passing cloud as if inviting its fate praying for heaven's fire as a blessing and when at last the old head is off another of the same shape immediately begins to grow on every bud and branch seems excited like bees that have lost their queen and tries hard to repair the damage branches that for many centuries have been growing out horizontally at once turn upward and all their branchlets arrange themselves with reference to a new top of the same peculiar curve as the old one even the small subordinate branches halfway down the trunk do their best to push up to the top and help this curious head-making the great age of these noble trees is even more wonderful than their huge size standing bravely up millennium in millennium out to all that fortune may bring them triumphant over tempest and fire and time fruitful and beautiful giving food and shelter to multitudes of small fleeting creatures dependent upon their bounty other trees may claim to be about as large or as old australian gums senegal baobabs mexican taxodiums english yews and venerable lebanon cedars trees of renown some of which are from ten to thirty feet in diameter we read of oaks that are supposed to have existed ever since the creation 
but strange to say i can find no definite accounts of the age of any of these trees but only estimates based on tradition and assumed average rates of growth no other known tree approaches the sequoia in grandeur height and thickness being considered and none as far as i know has looked down on so many centuries or opens such impressive and suggestive views of history the majestic monument of the king's river forest is as we have seen fully four thousand years old and measuring the rings of annual growth we find it was no less than twenty-seven feet in diameter at the beginning of the christian era while many observations lead me to expect the discovery of others ten or twenty centuries older as to those of moderate age there are thousands mere youth as yet that saw the light that shone on mohammed's uplifted crescent on many a royal gilded throne the deed forgotten in the present saw the age of sacred trees and druid groves and mystic larches and saw from forest domes like these the builder bring his gothic arches great trees and groves used to be venerated as sacred monuments and halls of council and worship but soon after the discovery of the calaveras grove one of the grandest trees was cut down for the sake of a stump the laborious vandals had seen the biggest tree in the world then forsooth they must try to see the biggest stump and dance on it the growth in height for the first two centuries is usually at a rate of eight to ten inches a year of course all the very large trees are old but those equal in size may vary greatly in age on account of variations in soil closeness or openness of growth etc thus a tree about ten feet in diameter that grew on the side of a meadow was according to my own count of the wood rings only two hundred and fifty nine years old at the time it was felled while another in the same grove of almost exactly the same size but less favorably situated was fourteen hundred and forty years old the calaveras tree cut for a dance floor was twenty-four feet in diameter and only thirteen hundred years old another about the same size was a thousand years older the following sequoia notes and measurements are copied from my notebooks diameter one and three-quarter inches height ten feet age seven years diameter five inches height twenty four feet age twenty years diameter five inches height twenty five feet age forty one years diameter six inches height twenty five feet age sixty six years diameter six inches height twenty eight and a half feet age thirty nine years diameter eight inches height twenty five feet age twenty nine years diameter eleven inches height forty five feet age seventy one years diameter one foot height sixty feet age seventy one years diameter three feet two inches height 156 feet age 260 years diameter 6 feet height 192 feet age 240 years diameter 7 feet 3 inches height 195 feet age 339 years height 7 feet 3 inches height 255 feet age 506 years diameter 7 feet 6 inches height 240 feet age 493 years diameter 7 feet 7 inches height 207 feet age 424 years diameter 9 feet height 243 feet age 259 years diameter nine feet three inches height two hundred and twenty two feet age two hundred and eighty years diameter ten feet six inches no height recorded age one thousand four hundred and forty years 
The rest of the measurements in this chart omit the height of the tree. Diameter 12 feet. Age 1,825 years. Diameter 15 feet. Age 2,150 years. Diameter 24 feet. Age 1,300 years. Diameter 25 feet. Age 2,300 years. Diameter 35 feet 8 inches. Inside the bark. Aged over 4,000 years. Little, however, is to be learned in confused, hurried tourist trips, spending only a poor, noisy hour in the branded grove with a guide. You should go looking and listening alone on long walks through the wild forests and groves in all the seasons of the year. In the spring, the winds are balmy and sweet, blowing up and down over great beds of chaparral and through the woods now rich in softening balsam and rosin and the scent of steaming earth. The sky is mostly sunshine, oftentimes tempered by magnificent clouds, the breath of the sea built up into new mountain ranges, warm during the day, cool at night, good flower-opening weather. The young cones of the big trees are showing in clusters, their flower time already past, and here and there you may see the sprouting of their tiny seeds of the previous autumn, taking their first feeble hold of the ground and unpacking their tender whorls of cotyledon leaves. Then you will naturally be led on to consider their wonderful growth up and up through the mountain weather, now buried in snow, bent and crinkled, now straightening in summer sunshine like uncoiling ferns, shooting eagerly aloft in youth's joyful prime, and towering serene and satisfied through countless years of calm and storm, the greatest of plants and all but immortal. Under the huge trees up come the small plant people, putting forth fresh leaves and blossoming in such profusion that the hills and valleys would still seem gloriously rich and glad were all the grand trees away. By the side of melting snowbanks rise the crimson sarcades, round-topped and massive as the sequoias themselves, and beds of blue violets and larger yellow ones, with leaves curiously lobed, azalea and saxifrage, daisies and lilies on the mossy banks of the streams, and a little way back of them, beneath the trees and on sunny spots on the hills around the groves, wild rose and rubus, spirea and ribes, metella, tirella, campanula, monardella, forget-me-not, etc., many of them as worthy of lore immortality as the famous Scotch daisy, wanting only a Burns to sing them home to all hearts. In the midst of this glad plant work, the birds are busy nesting, some singing at their work, some silent, others, especially the big pileated woodpeckers, about as noisy as backwoodsmen building their cabins. Then every bower in the groves is a bridal bower, the winds murmur softly overhead, the streams sing with the birds, while from far off waterfalls and thunderclouds come deep rolling organ notes. In summer the days go by in almost constant brightness, cloudless sunshine pouring over the forest roof, while in the shady depths there is the subdued light of perpetual morning. The new leaves and cones are growing fast and make a grand show. Seeds are ripening, young birds learning to fly, and with myriads of insects, glad as birds, keep the air whirling, joy in every wing beat, their humming and singing blending with the gentle eyeing of the winds, while at evening every thicket and grove is enchanted by the tranquil chirping of the blessed hylas, the sweetest and most peaceful of sounds, telling the very heart joy of earth as it rolls through the heavens. In the autumn the sighing of the winds is softer than ever, the gentle ah-eyeing filling the sky with a fine universal mist of music, the birds have little to say, and there is no appreciable stir or rustling among the trees save that caused by the harvesting squirrels. Most of the seeds are ripe and away, those of the trees mottling the sunny air, glinting, glancing through the midst of merry insect people, rocks and trees, everything alike drenched in gold light, 
heaven's colors coming down to the meadows and groves making every leaf a romance air earth and water in peace beyond thought the great brooding days opening and closing in divine psalms of color winter comes suddenly arrayed in storms though to mountaineers silky streamers on the peaks and the tones of the wind give sufficient warning you hear strange whisperings among the treetops as if the giants were taking counsel together one after another nodding and swaying calling and replying spreads the news until all with one accord break forth into glorious song welcoming the first grand snowstorm of the year and looming up in the dim clouds and snowdrifts like lighthouse towers in flying scud and spray studying the behavior of the giants from some friendly shelter you will see that even in the glow of their wildest enthusiasm when the storm roars loudest they never lose their godlike composure never toss their arms or bow or wave like the pines but only slowly solemnly nod and sway standing erect making no sign of strife none of rest neither in alliance nor at war with the winds too calmly unconsciously noble and strong to strive with or bid defiance to anything owing to the density of the leafy branchlets and great breadth of the head the big tree carries a much heavier load of snow than any of its neighbors and after a storm when the sky clears the laden trees are a glorious spectacle worth any amount of cold camping to see every bossy limb and crown is solid white and the immense height of the giants becomes visible as the eye travels the white steps of the colossal tower each relieved by a mass of blue shadow in midwinter the forest depths are as fresh and pure as the crevices and caves of glaciers grouse nuthatches a few woodpeckers and other hardy birds dwell in the groves all winter and the squirrels may be seen every clear day frisking about lively as ever tunneling to their stores never coming up empty-mouthed diving in the loose snow about as quickly as ducks in water while storms and sunshine sing to each other one of the noblest and most beautiful of the late winter sights is the blossoming of the big tree like gigantic golden rods and the sowing of their pollen over all the forest and the snow-covered ground a most glorious view of nature's immortal virility and flower love end of section seventeen section eighteen of our national parks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in June 2021. Our National Parks by John Muir, Chapter 9, Part 2 One of my own best excursions among the sequoias was made in the autumn of 1875 when I explored the then unknown or little known sequoia region south of the Mariposa Grove for comprehensive views of the belt and to learn what i could of the peculiar distribution of the species and its history in general in particular i was anxious to try and find out whether it had ever been more widely distributed since the glacial period what conditions favorable or otherwise were affecting it what were its relations to climate topography soil and the other trees growing with it etc and whether as was generally supposed the species was nearing extinction i was already acquainted in a general way with the northern groves but excepting some passing glimpses gained on excursions into the high sierra about the headwaters of kings and kern rivers i had seen nothing of the south end of the belt nearly all my mountaineering has been done on foot carrying as little as possible depending upon camp fires for warmth that so i might be light and free to go wherever my studies might lead on this sequoia trip which promised to be long i was persuaded to take a small wild mule with me to carry provisions and a pair of blankets 
the friendly owner of the animal having noticed that i sometimes looked tired when i came down from the peaks to replenish my bread sack assured me that this little brownie mule was just what i wanted tough as a nut perfectly untireable low and narrow just right for squeezing through brush able to climb like a chipmunk jump from boulder to boulder like a wild sheep and go anywhere a man could go but tough as he was and accomplished as a climber many a time in the course of our journey when he was jaded and hungry wedged fast in rocks or struggling in chaparral like a fly in a spider web his troubles were sad to see and i wished he would leave me and find his way home alone we set out for yosemite about the end of august and our first camp was made in the well-known mariposa grove here and in the adjacent pine woods i spent nearly a week carefully examining the boundaries of the grove for traces of its greater extension without finding any then i struck out into the majestic trackless forest to the southeastward hoping to find new groves or traces of old ones in the dense silver fir and pine woods about the head of big creek where soil and climate seemed most favorable to their growth but not a single tree or old monument of any sort came to light until i climbed the high rock called wamalo by the indians here i obtained telling views of the fertile forest field basin of the upper fresno innumerable spires of the noble yellow pine were displayed rising above one another on the braided slopes and yet nobler sugar pines with superb arms outstretched in the rich autumn light while away to the southwest on the verge of the glowing horizon i discovered the majestic dome-like crowns of big trees towering high over all singly and in close grove congregations there is something wonderfully attractive in this king tree even when beheld from afar that draws us to it with indescribable enthusiasm its superior height and massive smoothly rounded outlines proclaiming its character in any company and when one of the oldest attains full stature on some commanding ridge and seems the very god of the woods i ran back to camp packed brownie steered over the divide and down into the heart of the fresno grove then choosing a camp on the side of a brook where the grass was good i made a cup of tea and set off free among the brown giants glorying in the abundance of new work about me one of the first special things that caught my attention was an extensive landslip the ground on the side of the stream had given way to a depth of about fifty feet and with all its trees had been launched into the bottom of the stream ravine most of the trees pines firs incense cedar and sequoia were still standing erect and uninjured as if unconscious that anything out of the common had happened tracing the ravine alongside the avalanche i saw many trees whose roots had been laid bare and in one instance discovered a sequoia about fifteen feet in diameter growing above an old prostrate trunk that seemed to belong to a former generation this slip had occurred seven or eight years ago and i was glad to find that not only were most of the big trees uninjured but that many companies of hopeful seedlings and saplings were growing confidently on the fresh soil along the broken front of the avalanche these young trees were already eight or ten feet high and were shooting up vigorously as if sure of eternal life though young pines firs and libocedrus were running a race with them for the sunshine with an even start farther down the ravine i counted five hundred and thirty-six promising young sequoias on a bed of rough bouldery soil not exceeding two acres in extent the fresno big trees covered an area about four square miles and while wandering about surveying the boundaries of the grove anxious to see every tree i came suddenly on a handsome log cabin richly embowered and so fresh and unweathered it was still redolent of gum and balsam like a newly felled tree strolling forward wondering who could have built it i found an old weary-eyed speculative gray-haired man on a bark stool by the door reading a book the discovery of his hermitage by a stranger seemed to surprise him but when i explained that i was only a tree lover sauntering along the mountains to study sequoia he bade me welcome made me bring my mule down to the little slanting meadow before his door and camp with him 
promising to show me his pet trees and many curious things bearing on my studies after supper as the evening shadows were falling the good hermit sketched his life in the mines which in the main was like that of most other pioneer gold hunters a succession of intense experiences full of big ups and downs like the mountain topography since forty nine he had wandered over most of the sierra sinking innumerable prospect holes like a sailor making soundings digging new channels for streams sifting gold sprinkled boulder and gravel beds with unquenchable energy life's noon the meanwhile passing unnoticed into late afternoon shadows then health and gold gone the game played and lost like a wounded deer creeping into this forest solitude he awaits the sundown call how sad the undertones of many a life here now the noise of the first big gold battles has died away how many interesting wrecks lie drifted and stranded in hidden nooks of the gold region perhaps no other range contains the remains of so many rare and interesting men the name of my hermit friend is john a nelder a fine kind man who in going into the woods has at last gone home for he loves nature truly and realizes that these last shadowy days with scarce a glint of gold in them are the best of all birds squirrels plants get loving natural recognition and delightful it was to see how sensitively he responds to the silent influences of the woods his eyes brightened as he gazed on the trees that stand guard around his little home squirrels and mountain quail come to his call to be fed and he tenderly stroked the little snow-bent sapling sequoias hoping they yet might grow straight to the sky and rule the grove one of the greatest of his trees stands a little way back of his cabin and he proudly led me to it bidding me admire its colossal proportions and measure it to see if in all the forest there could be another so grand it proved to be only twenty-six feet in diameter and he seemed distressed to learn that the mariposa grizzly giant was larger i tried to comfort him by observing that his was the taller finer form and perhaps the more favorably situated then he led me to some noble ruins remnants of gigantic trunks of trees that he supposed must have been larger than any now standing and though they had lain on the damp ground exposed to fire and the weather for centuries the wood was perfectly sound sequoia timber is not only beautiful in color rose red when fresh and as easily worked as pine but it is almost absolutely unperishable build a house of big tree logs on granite and that house will last about as long as its foundation indeed fire seems to be the only agent that has any appreciable effect on it from one of these ancient trunk remnants i cut a specimen of the wood which neither in color strength nor soundness could be distinguished from specimens cut from living trees although it had certainly lain on the damp forest floor for more than three hundred and eighty years probably more than thrice as long the time in this instance was determined as follows when the tree from which the specimen was derived fell it sunk itself into the ground making a ditch about two hundred feet long and five or six feet deep and in the middle of this ditch where a part of the fallen trunk had been burned a silver fir four feet in diameter and three hundred and eighty years old was growing showing that the sequoia trunk had lain on the ground three hundred and eighty years plus the unknown time that it lay before the part whose place had been taken by the fire was burned out of the way and that which had elapsed ere the seed from which this monumental fir sprang fell into the prepared soil and took root now because sequoia trunks are never wholly consumed in one forest fire and these fires recur only at considerable intervals and because sequoia ditches after being cleared are often left unplanted for centuries it becomes evident that the trunk remnant in question may have been on the ground a thousand years or more similar vestiges are common and together with the root bowls and long straight ditches of the fallen monarchs throw a sure light back on the post-glacial history of the species bearing on its distribution one of the most interesting features of this grove is the apparent ease and strength and comfortable independence in which the trees occupy their place in the general forest 
seedlings saplings young and middle-aged trees are grouped promisingly around the old patriarchs betraying no sign of approach to extinction on the contrary all seem to be saying everything is to our mind and we mean to live for ever but sad to tell a lumber company was building a large mill and flume nearby assuring widespread destruction in the cones and sometimes in the lower portion of the trunk and roots there is a dark gritty substance which dissolves readily in water and yields a magnificent purple color it is a strong astringent and is said to be used by the indians as a big medicine mr nelder showed me specimens of ink he had made from it which i tried and found good flowing freely and holding its color well indeed everything about the tree seems constant with these interesting trees forming the largest of the northern groves i stopped only a week for i had far to go before the fall of the snow the hermit seemed to cling to me and tried to make me promise to winter with him after the season's work was done brownie had to be got home however and other work awaited me therefore i could only promise to stop a day or two on my way back to yosemite and give him the forest news the next two weeks were spent in the wide basin of the san joaquin climbing innumerable ridges and surveying the far extending sea of pines and firs but not a single sequoia crown appeared among them all nor any trace of a fallen trunk until i had crossed the south divide of the basin opposite dinky creek one of the northernmost tributaries of king's river on this stream there is a small grove said to have been discovered a few years before my visit by two hunters in pursuit of a wounded bear just as i was fording one of the branches of dinky creek i met a shepherd and when i asked him whether he knew anything about the big trees of the neighborhood he replied i know all about them for i visited them only a few days ago and pastured my sheep in the grove he was fresh from the east and as this was his first summer in the sierra i was curious to learn what impression the sequoias had made on him when i asked whether it was true that the big trees were really so big as people say he warmly replied oh yes sir you bet they're whales i never used to believe half i heard about the awful size of california trees but they're monsters and no mistake one of them over here they tell me is the biggest tree in the whole world and i guess it is for it's forty foot through and as many good long paces round he was very earnest and in fullness of faith offered to guide me to the grove that i might not miss seeing this biggest tree a fair measurement four feet from the ground above the main swell of the roots showed a diameter of only thirty-two feet much to the young man's disgust only thirty-two feet he lamented only thirty-two and i always thought it was forty then with a sigh of relief no matter it's a big tree anyway no fool of a tree sir that you can cut a plank out of thirty feet broad straight edged no bark all good wood sound and solid it would make the brag white pine planks from old maine look like laths a good many old fine specimens are distributed along three small branches of the creek and i noticed several thrifty moderate-sized sequoias growing on a granite ledge apparently as independent of deep soil as the pines and firs clinging to seams and fissures and sending their roots far abroad in search of moisture the creek is very clear and beautiful gliding through tangles of shrubs and flower beds gay bee and butterfly pastures the grove's own stream pure sequoia water flowing all the year every drop filtered through moss and leaves and the myriad spongy rootlets of the giant trees one of the most interesting features of the grove is a small waterfall with a flowery ferny clear brimming pool at the foot of it how cheerily it sings the songs of the wilderness how sweet its tones you seem to taste as well as to hear them while only the subdued roar of the river in the deep canyon reaches up into the grove sounding like the sea and the winds so charming a fall and a pool in the heart of so glorious a forest good pagans would have consecrated to some lovely nymph hence down in the main king's river canyon a mile deep i led and dragged and showed my patient much enduring mule through miles and miles of gardens and brush 
fording innumerable streams crossing savage rock slopes and taluses scrambling sliding through gulches and gorges then up into the grand sequoia forests of the south side cheered by the royal crowns displayed on the narrow horizon in a day and a half we reached the sequoia woods in the neighborhood of the old thomas mill flat thence striking off northeastward i found a magnificent forest nearly six miles long by two in width composed mostly of big trees with outlying groves as far east as boulder creek here five or six days were spent and it was delightful to learn from countless trees old and young how comfortably they were settled down in concordance with climate and soil and their noble neighbors embedded in these majestic woods there are numerous meadows around the sides of which the big trees press close together in beautiful lines showing their grandeur openly from the ground to their domed heads in the sky the young trees are still more numerous and exuberant than in the fresno and dinky groves standing apart in beautiful family groups or crowded around the old giants for every venerable lightning-stricken tree there is one or more in all the glory of prime and for each of these many young trees and crowds of saplings the young trees express the grandeur of their race in a way indefinable by any words at my command when they are five or six feet in diameter and a hundred and fifty feet high they seem like mere baby saplings as many inches in diameter their juvenile habits and gestures completely veiling their real size even to those who from long experience are able to make fair approximation in their measurements of common trees one morning i noticed three airy spiry quick-growing babies on the side of a meadow the largest of which i took to be about eight inches in diameter on measuring it i found to my astonishment that it was five feet six inches in diameter and about a hundred and forty feet high on a bed of sandy ground fifteen yards square which had been occupied by four sugar pines i counted ninety-four promising seedlings an instance of sequoia gaining ground from its neighbors here also i noted eighty-six young sequoias from one to fifty feet high on less than half an acre of ground that had been cleared and prepared for their reception by fire this was a small bay burned into dense chaparral showing that fire the great destroyer of tree life is sometimes followed by conditions favorable for new growths sufficient fresh soil however is furnished for the constant renewal of the forest by the fall of old trees without the help of any other agent burrowing animals fire flood landslip etc for the ground is thus turned and stirred as well as cleared and in every roomy shady hollow beside the walls of upturned roots many hopeful seedlings spring up the largest and as far as i know the oldest of all the king's river trees that i saw is the majestic stump already referred to about a hundred and forty feet high which above the swell of the roots is thirty-five feet and eight inches inside the bark and over four thousand years old it was burned nearly half through at the base and i spent a day in chopping off the charred surface cutting into the heart and counting the wood rings with the aid of a lens i made out a little over four thousand without difficulty or doubt but i was unable to get a complete count owing to confusion in the rings where wounds had been healed over judging by what is left of it this was a fine tall symmetrical tree nearly forty feet in diameter before it lost its bark in the last sixteen hundred and seventy-two years the increase in diameter was ten feet a short distance south of this forest lies a beautiful grove now mostly included in the general grant national park i found many shake makers at work in it access to these magnificent woods having been made easy by the old mill wagon road the park is only two miles square and the largest of its many fine trees is the general grant so named before the date of my first visit twenty-eight years ago and said to be the largest tree in the world though above the craggy bulging base the diameter is less than thirty feet 
the sanger lumber company owns nearly all the king's river groves outside the park and for many years the mills have been spreading desolation without any advantage one of the shake makers directed me to an old snag bigger and grand it proved to be a huge black charred stump thirty-two feet in diameter the next in size to the grand monument mentioned above i found a scattered growth of big trees extending across the main divide to within a short distance of hyde's mill on a tributary of dry creek the mountain ridge on the south side of the stream was covered from base to summit with a most superb growth of big trees what a picture it made in all my wide forest wanderings i had seen none so sublime every tree of all the mighty host seemed perfect in beauty and strength and their majestic domed heads rising above one another on the mountain slope were most imposingly displayed like a range of bossy upswelling cumulus clouds on a calm day in this glorious forest the mill was busy forming a sore sad center of destruction though small as yet so immensely heavy was the growth only the smaller and most accessible of the trees were being cut the logs from three to ten or twelve feet in diameter were dragged or rolled with long strings of oxen into a chute and sent flying down the steep mountain side to the mill flat where the largest of them were blasted into manageable dimensions for the saws and as the timber is very brash by this blasting and careless felling on uneven ground half or three-fourths of the timber was wasted End of section eighteen. Section nineteen of Our National Parks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana our national parks by john muir chapter nine part three i spent several days exploring the ridge and counting the annual wood rings on a large number of stumps in the clearings then replenished my bread sack and pushed on southward all the way across the broad rough basins of the kaway and tool rivers sequoia ruled supreme forming an almost continuous belt for sixty or seventy miles waving up and down in huge massy mountain billows in compliance with the grand glacier ploughed topography day after day from grove to grove canyon to canyon i made a long wavering way terribly rough in some places for brownie but cheery for me for big trees were seldom out of sight we crossed the rugged picturesque basins of redwood creek the north fork of the kaway the marble fork gloriously forested and full of beautiful cascades and falls sheer and slanting infinitely varied with broad curly foam fleeces and strips of embroidery in which the sunbeams revel thence we climbed into the noble forest on the marble and middle fork divide after a general exploration of the Kaway Basin, this part of the Sequoia Belt seemed to me the finest, and I then named it the Giant Forest. It extends, a magnificent growth of giants, grouped in pure temple groves, ranged in colonnades along the sides of meadows, or scattered among the other trees from the granite headlands overlooking the hot foothills and the plains of the San Joaquin, back to within a few miles of the old glacier fountains at an elevation of five thousand to eight thousand four hundred feet above the sea when i entered this sublime wilderness the day was nearly done the trees with rosy glowing countenances seemed to be hushed and thoughtful as if waiting in conscious religious dependence on the sun and one naturally walked softly and awe-stricken among them i wandered on meeting nobler trees where all are noble subdued in a general calm as if in some vast hall pervaded by the deepest sanctities and solemnities that sway human souls at sundown the trees seemed to cease their worship and breathe free 
i heard the birds going home i too sought a home for the night on the edge of a level meadow where there is a long open view between the evenly ranked trees standing guard along its sides then after a good place was found for poor brownie who had had a hard weary day sliding and scrambling across the marble canyon i made my bed and supper and lay on my back looking up to the stars through pillared arches finer far than the pious heart of man telling its love ever reared then i took a walk up the meadow to see the trees in the pale light they seemed still more marvelously massive and tall than by day heaving their colossal heads into the depths of the sky among the stars some of which appeared to be sparkling on their branches like flowers i built a big fire that vividly illumined the huge brown boles of the nearest trees and the little plants and cones and fallen leaves at their feet keeping up the show until i fell asleep to dream of boundless forests and trail building for brownie joyous birds welcomed the dawn and the squirrels now their food cones were ripe and had to be quickly gathered and stored for winter began their work before sunrise my tea and bread crumb breakfast was soon done and leaving jaded brownie to feed and rest i sauntered forth to my studies in every direction sequoia ruled the woods most of the other big conifers were present here and there but not as rivals or companions they only served to thicken and enrich the general wilderness trees of every age cover craggy ridges as well as the deep moraine soiled slopes and plant their magnificent shafts along every brookside and meadow bogs and meadows are rare or entirely wanting in the isolated groves north of king's river here there is a beautiful series of them lying on the broad top of the main dividing ridge embedded in the very heart of the mammoth woods as if for ornament their smooth plushy bosoms kept bright and fertile by streams and sunshine resting a while on one of the most beautiful of them when the sun was high it seemed impossible that any other forest picture in the world could rival it there lay the grassy flowery lawn three-fourths of a mile long smoothly outspread basking in mellow autumn light colored brown and yellow and purple streaked with lines of green along the streams and ruffled here and there with patches of ledum and scarlet vaccinium around the margin there is first a fringe of azalea and willow bushes colored orange yellow enlivened with vivid dashes of red cornell as if painted then up spring the mighty walls of the verdure three hundred feet high the brown fluted pillars so thick and tall and strong they seem fit to uphold the sky the dense foliage swelling forward in rounded bosses on the upper half variously shaded and tinted that of the young trees dark green of the old yellowish an aged lightning smitten patriarch standing a little forward beyond the general line with knotty arms outspread was covered with gray and yellow lichens and surrounded by a group of saplings whose slender spires seemed to lack not a single leaf or spray in their wondrous perfection such was the Kaway meadow picture that golden afternoon and as i gazed every color seemed to deepen and glow as if the progress of the fresh sun work were visible from hour to hour while every tree seemed religious and conscious of the presence of god a free man revels in a scene like this and time goes by unmeasured i stood fixed in silent wonder or sauntered about shifting my points of view studying the physiognomy of separate trees and going out to the different color patches to see how they were put on and what they were made of giving free expression to my joy exulting in nature's wild immortal vigor and beauty never dreaming any other human being was near suddenly the spell was broken by dull bumping thudding sounds and a man and horse came in sight at the farther end of the meadow where they seemed sadly out of place a good big bear or mastodon or a megatherium would have been more in keeping with the old mammoth forest 
nevertheless it is always pleasant to meet one of our own species after solitary rambles and i stepped out where i could be seen and shouted when the rider reined in his galloping mustang and waited my approach he seemed too much surprised to speak until laughing in his puzzled face i said that i was glad to meet a fellow mountaineer in so lonely a place then he abruptly asked what are you doing how did you get here i explained that i came across the canyons from yosemite and was only looking at the trees oh then i know he said greatly to my surprise you must be john muir he was herding a band of horses that had been driven up the rough trail from the lowlands to feed on these forest meadows a few handfuls of crumb detritus was all that was left in my bread sack so i told him that i was nearly out of provision and asked whether he could spare me a little flour oh yes of course you can have anything i've got he said just take my track and it will lead you to my camp in a big hollow log on the side of a meadow two or three miles from here i must ride after some strayed horses but i'll be back before night in the meantime make yourself at home he galloped away to the northward i returned to my own camp saddled brownie and by the middle of the afternoon discovered his noble den in a fallen sequoia hollowed by fire a spacious log house of one log carbon lined centuries old yet sweet and fresh weatherproof earthquake proof likely to outlast the most durable stone castle and commanding views of garden and grove grander far than the richest king ever enjoyed brownie found plenty of grass and i found bread which i ate with views from the big round ever open door soon the good samaritan mountaineer came in and i enjoyed a famous rest listening to his observations on trees animals adventures etc while he was busily preparing supper in answer to inquiries concerning the distribution of the big trees he gave a good deal of particular information of the forest we were in and he had heard that the species extended a long way south he knew not how far i wandered about for several days within a radius of six or seven miles of the camp surveying boundaries measuring trees and climbing the highest points for general views from the south side of the divide i saw telling ranks of sequoia crowned headlands stretching far into the hazy distance and plunging vaguely down into profound canyon depths foreshadowing weeks of good work i had now been out on the trip more than a month and i began to fear my studies would be interrupted by snow for winter was drawing nigh where there isn't a way make a way is easily said when no way at the time is needed but to the sierra explorer with a mule traveling across the canyon lines of drainage the brave old phrase becomes heavy with meaning there are ways across the sierra graded by glaciers well marked and followed by men and beasts and birds and one of them even by locomotives but none natural or artificial along the range and the explorer who would thus travel at right angles to the glacial ways must traverse canyons and ridges extending side by side in endless succession roughened by side gorges and gulches and stubborn chaparral and defended by innumerable sheer fronted precipices my own ways are easily made in any direction but brownie though one of the toughest and most skilful of his race was oftentimes discouraged for want of hands and caused endless work wild at first he was tame enough now and when turned loose he not only refused to run away but as his troubles increased came to depend on me in such a pitiful touching way i became attached to him and helped him as if he were a good-natured boy in distress and then the labor grew lighter bidding good-bye to the kind sequoia cave dweller we vanished again in the wilderness drifting slowly southward sequoias on every ridge top beckoning and pointing the way in the forest between the middle and east forks of the kaway i met a great fire and as fire is the master scourge and controller of the distribution of trees i stopped to watch it and learn what i could of its works and ways with the giants 
it came racing up the steep chaparral covered slopes of the east fork canyon with passionate enthusiasm in a broad cataract of flames now bending down low to feed on green bushes devouring acres of them at a breath now towering high in the air as if looking abroad to choose a way then stooping to feed again the lurid flapping surges and the smoke and terrible rushing and roaring hiding all that is gentle and orderly in the work but as soon as the deep forest was reached the ungovernable flood became calm like a torrent entering a lake creeping and spreading beneath the trees where the ground was level or sloped gently slowly nibbling the cake of compressed needles and scales with flames an inch high rising here and there to a foot or two on dry twigs and clumps of small bushes and brome grass only at considerable intervals were fierce bonfires lighted where heavy branches broken off by snow had accumulated or around some venerable giant whose head had been stricken off by lightning i tethered brownie on the edge of a little meadow beside a stream a good safe way off and then cautiously chose a camp for myself in a big stout hollow trunk not likely to be crushed by the fall of burning trees and made a bed of ferns and boughs in it the night however and the strange wild fireworks were too beautiful and exciting to allow much sleep there was no danger of being chased and hemmed in for in the main forest belt of the sierra even when swift winds are blowing fires seldom or never sweep over the trees in broad all-embracing sheets as they do in the dense rocky mountain woods and in those of the cascade mountains of oregon and washington here they creep from tree to tree with tranquil deliberation allowing close observation though caution is required in venturing around the burning giants to avoid falling limbs and knots and fragments from dead shattered tops though the day was best for study i sauntered about night after night learning what i could and admiring the wonderful show vividly displayed in the lonely darkness the ground fire advancing in long crooked lines gently grazing and smoking on the close-pressed leaves springing up in thousands of little jets of pure flame on dry tassels and twigs and tall spires and flat sheets with jagged flapping edges dancing here and there on grass tufts and bushes big bonfires blazing in perfect storms of energy where heavy branches mixed with small ones lay smashed together in hundred cord piles big red arches between spreading root swells and trees growing close together huge fire-mantled trunks on the hill slopes glowing like bars of hot iron violet-colored fire running up the tall trees tracing the furrows of the bark in quick quivering rills and lighting magnificent torches on dry shattered tops and ever and anon with a tremendous roar and burst of light young trees clad in low descending feathery branches vanishing in one flame two or three hundred feet high one of the most impressive and beautiful sights was made by the great fallen trunks lying on the hillsides all red and glowing like colossal iron bars fresh from a furnace two hundred feet long some of them and ten to twenty feet thick after repeated burnings have consumed the bark and sapwood the sound charred surface being full of cracks and sprinkled with leaves is quickly overspread with a pure rich furred ruby glow almost flameless and smokeless producing a marvelous effect in the night another grand and interesting sight are the fires on the tops of the largest living trees flaming above the green branches at a height of perhaps two hundred feet entirely cut off from the ground fires and looking like signal beacons on watch-towers from one standpoint i sometimes saw a dozen or more those in the distance looking like great stars above the forest floor at first i could not imagine how these sequoia lamps were lighted but the very first night strolling about waiting and watching i saw the thing done again and again the thick fibrous bark of old trees is divided by deep nearly continuous furrows the sides of which are bearded with the bristling ends of fibres broken by the growth swelling of the trunk 
and when the fire comes creeping around the feet of the trees it runs up these bristly furrows in lovely pale blue quivering bickering rills of flame with a low earnest whispering sound to the lightning shattered top of the trunk which in dry indian summer with perhaps leaves and twigs and squirrel gnawed cone scales and seed wings lodged in it is readily ignited these lamplighting rills the most beautiful fire streams i ever saw last only a minute or two but the big lamps burn with varying brightness for days and weeks throwing off sparks like the spray of a fountain while ever and anon a shower of red coals comes sifting down through the branches followed at times with startling effect by a big burned-off chunk weighing perhaps half a ton the immense bonfires where fifty or a hundred cords of peeled split smashed wood has been piled around some old giant by a single stroke of lightning is another grand sight in the night the light is so great i found i could read common print three hundred yards from them and the illumination of the circle of onlooking trees is indescribably impressive other big fires roaring and booming like waterfalls were blazing on the upper sides of the trees on hill slopes against which limbs broken off by heavy snow had rolled while branches high overhead tossed and shaken by the ascending air current seemed to be writhing in pain perhaps the most startling phenomenon of all was the quick death of childlike sequoias only a century or two of age in the midst of the other comparatively slow and steady firework one of these tall beautiful saplings leafy and branchy would be seen blazing up suddenly all in one heaving booming passionate flame reaching from the ground to the top of the tree and fifty to a hundred feet or more above it with a smoke column bending forward and streaming away on the upper free-flowing wind to burn these green trees a strong fire of dry wood beneath them is required to send them up a current of air hot enough to distill inflammable gases from the leaves and sprays then instead of the lower limbs gradually catching fire and igniting the next and the next in succession the whole tree seems to explode almost simultaneously and with awful roaring and throbbing a round tapering flame shoots up two or three hundred feet and in a second or two is quenched, leaving the green spire a black dead mast, bristled and roughened with down-curling boughs. Nearly all the trees that have been burned down are lying with their heads uphill, because they are burned far more deeply on the upper side, on account of broken limbs rolling down against them to make hot fires, while only leaves and twigs accumulate on the lower side, and are quickly consumed without injury to the tree but green resinless sequoia wood burns very slowly and many successive fires are required to burn down a large tree fires can run only at intervals of several years and when the ordinary amount of firewood that has rolled against the gigantic trunk is consumed only a shallow scar is made which is slowly deepened by recurring fires until far beyond the center of gravity and when at last the tree falls it, of course falls uphill the healing folds of wood layers on some of the deeply burned trees show that centuries have elapsed since the last wounds were made when a great sequoia falls its head is smashed into fragments about as small as those made by lightning which are mostly devoured by the first running hunting fire that finds them while the trunk is slowly wasted away by centuries of fire and weather one of the most interesting fire actions on the trunk is the boring of those great tunnel-like hollows through which horsemen may gallop all of these famous hollows are burned out of the solid wood for no sequoia is ever hollowed by decay when the tree falls the brash trunk is often broken straight across into sections as if sawed into these joints the fire creeps and on account of the great size of the broken ends burns for weeks or even months without being much influenced by the weather after the great glowing ends fronting each other have burned so far apart that their rims cease to burn the fire continues to work on it in the centers and the ends become deeply concave 
then heat being radiated from side to side the burning goes on in each section of the trunk independent of the other until the diameter of the bore is so great that the heat radiated across from side to side is not sufficient to keep them burning it appears therefore that only very large trees can receive the fire auger and have any shell rim left fire attacks the large trees only at the ground consuming the fallen leaves and humus at their feet doing them but little harm unless considerable quantities of fallen limbs happen to be piled about them their thick mail of spongy unpitchy almost unburnable bark affording strong protection therefore the oldest and most perfect unscarred trees are found on ground that is nearly level while those growing on hillsides against which falling branches roll are always deeply scarred on the upper side and as we have seen are sometimes burned down the saddest thing of all was to see these hopeful seedlings many of them crinkled and bent with the pressure of winter snow yet bravely aspiring at the top helplessly perishing and young trees perfect spires of verdure and naturally immortal suddenly changed to dead mass yet the sun looked cheerily down the openings in the forest roof turning the black smoke to a beautiful brown as if all was for the best end of section nineteen Section 20 of Our National Parks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in June 2021. Our National Parks by John Muir. Chapter 9, Part 4 beneath the smoke clouds of the suffering forest we again push southward descending a side gorge of the east fork canyon and climbing another into new forests and groves not a whit less noble brownie the meanwhile had been resting while i was weary and sleepy with almost ceaseless wanderings giving only an hour or two each night or day to sleep in my log home waymaking here seemed to become more and more difficult impossible in common phrase for four-legged travellers two or three miles was all the day's work as far as distance was concerned nevertheless just before sundown we found a charming campground with plenty of grass and a forest to study that had felt no fire for many a year the camp hollow was evidently a favorite home of bears on many of the trees at the height of six or eight feet their autographs were inscribed in strong free-flowing strokes on the soft bark where they had stood up like cats to stretch their limbs using both hands every claw a pen the handsome curved lines of their writing take the form of remarkably regular interlacing pointed arches producing a truly ornamental effect i looked and listened half expecting to see some of the riders alarmed and withdrawing from the unwanted disturbance brownie also looked and listened for mules fear bears instinctively and have a very keen nose for them when i turned him loose instead of going to the best grass he kept cautiously near the campfire for protection but was careful not to step on me the great starry night passed away in deep peace and the rosy morning sunbeams were searching the grove ere i woke from a long blessed sleep the breadth of the sequoia belt here is about the same as on the north side of the river extending rather thin and scattered in some places among the noble pines from near the main forest belt of the range well back towards the frosty peaks where most of the trees were growing on moraines but little changed as yet two days scramble above bear hollow i enjoyed an interesting interview with deer soon after sunrise a little company of four came to my camp in a wild garden embedded in chaparral and after much cautious observation quietly began to eat breakfast with me 
keeping perfectly still i soon had their confidence and they came so near i found no difficulty while admiring their graceful manners and gestures in determining what plants they were eating thus gaining a far finer knowledge and sympathy than comes by killing and hunting indian summer gold with scarce a whisper of winter in it was painting the glad wilderness in richer and yet richer colors as we scrambled across the south canyon into the basin of the tool here the big tree forests are still more extensive and furnished abundance of work in tracing boundaries and gloriously crowned ridges up and down back and forth exploring studying admiring while the great measureless days passed on and away uncounted but in the calm of the campfire the end of the season seemed near brownie too often brought snowstorms to mind he became doubly jaded though i never rode him and always left him in camp to feed and rest while i explored the invincible bread business also troubled me again the last mealy crumbs were consumed and grass was becoming scarce even in the roughest rock piles naturally inaccessible to sheep one afternoon as i gazed over the rolling bossy sequoia billows stretching interminably southward seeking a way and counting how far i might go without food a rifle shot rang out sharp and clear marking the direction i pushed gladly on hoping to find some hunter who could spare a little food within a few hundred rods i struck the track of a shod horse which led to the camp of two indian shepherds one of them was cooking supper when i arrived glancing curiously at me he saw that i was hungry and gave me some mutton and bread and said encouragingly as he pointed to the west pretty soon indian come heap speak english toward sundown two thousand sheep beneath a cloud of dust came streaming through the grand sequoias to a meadow below the camp and presently the english-speaking shepherd came in to whom i explained my wants and what i was doing like most white men he could not conceive how anything other than gold could be the object of such rambles as mine and asked repeatedly whether i had discovered any mines i tried to make him talk about trees and the wild animals but unfortunately he proved to be a tame indian from the tule reservation had been to school claimed to be civilized and spoke contemptuously of wild indians and so of course his inherited instincts were blurred or lost the big trees he said grew far south for he had seen them in crossing the mountains from porterville to lone pine in the morning he kindly gave me a few pounds of flour and assured me that i would get plenty more at a sawmill on the south fork if i reached it before it was shut down for the season of all the tule basin forest the section on the north fork seemed the finest surpassing i think even the giant forest of the Coway southward from here though the width and general continuity of the belt is well sustained i thought i could detect a slight falling off in the height of the trees and in closeness of growth all the basin was swept by swarms of hoofed locusts the southern part over and over again until not a leaf within reach was left on the wettest bogs the outer edges of the thorniest chaparral beds or even on the young conifers which unless under the stress of dire famine sheep never touch of course brownie suffered though i made diligent search for grassy sheep-proof spots turning him loose one evening on the side of a carex bog he dolefully prospected the desolate neighborhood without finding anything that even a starving mule could eat then utterly discouraged he stole up behind me while i was bent over on my knees making a fire for tea and in a pitiful mixture of bray and neigh begged for help it was a mighty touching prayer and i answered it as well as i could with half of what was left of a cake made from the last of the flour given me by the indians hastily passing it over my shoulder and saying yes poor fellow i know but soon you'll have plenty to-morrow down we go to alfalfa and barley speaking to him as if he were human as through stress of trouble plainly he was after eating his portion of bread he seemed content for he said no more but patiently turned away to gnaw leafless ceanothus stubs 
such clinging confiding dependence after all our scrambles and adventures together was very touching and i felt conscience-stricken for having led him so far in so rough and desolate a country man says lord bacon is the god of the dog so also he is of the mule and many other dependent fellow-mortals next morning i turned westward determined to force a way straight to pasture letting sequoia wait fortunately ere we had struggled down through half a mile of chaparral we heard a mill whistle for which we gladly made a bee-line at the sawmill we both got a good meal then taking the dusty lumber road pursued our way to the lowlands the nearest good pasture i counted might be thirty or forty miles away but scarcely had we gone ten when i noticed a little log cabin a hundred yards or so back from the road and a tall man straight as a pine standing in front of it observing us as we came plodding down through the dust seeing no sign of grass or hay i was going past without stopping when he shouted travelin then drawing nearer where have you come from i didn't notice you go up i replied that i had come through the woods from the north looking at the trees oh then you must be john muir halt you're tired come and rest and i'll cook for you then i explained that i was tracing the sequoia belt that on account of sheep my mule was starving and therefore must push on to the lowlands no no he said that corral over there is full of hay and grain turn your mule into it i don't own it but the fellow who does is hauling lumber and it'll be all right he's a white man come and rest how tired you must be the big trees don't go much farther south no how i know the country up there have hunted all over it come and rest and let your little dog on rat of a mule rest how in heavens did you get him across the canyons roll him or carry him he's poor but he'll get fat and i'll give you a horse and go with you up the mountains and while you're looking at the trees i'll go a-hunting it'll be a short job for the end of the big trees is not far of course i stopped no true invitation is ever declined he had been hungry and tired himself many a time in the rocky mountains as well as in the sierra now he owned a band of cattle and lived alone his cabin was about eight by ten feet the door at one end a fireplace at the other and a bed on one side fastened to the logs leading me in without a word of mean apology he made me lie down on the bed then reached under it brought forth a sack of apples and advised me to keep chawing at them until he got supper ready finer braver hospitality i never found in all this good world so often called selfish next day with hearty easy alacrity the mountaineer procured horses prepared and packed provisions and got everything ready for an early start the following morning well mounted we pushed rapidly upon the south fork of the river and soon after noon were among the giants once more on the divide between the tule and deer creek a central camp was made and the mountaineer spent his time in deer hunting while with provisions for two or three days i explored the woods and in accordance with what i had been told soon reached the southern extremity of the belt on the south fork of deer creek to make sure i searched the woods a considerable distance south of the last deer creek grove passed over into the basin of the kern and climbed several high points commanding extensive views over the sugar pine woods without seeing a single sequoia crown in all the wide expanse to the southward on the way back to camp however i was greatly interested in a grove i discovered on the east side of the kern river divide opposite the north fork of deer creek the height of the pass where the species crossed over is about seven thousand feet and i heard of still another grove whose waters drain into the upper kern opposite the middle fork of the tool it appears therefore that though the sequoia belt is two hundred and sixty miles long most of the trees are on a section to the south of king's river only about seventy miles in length but though the area occupied by the species increases so much to the southward there is but little difference in the size of the trees a diameter of twenty feet and a height of two hundred and seventy-five is perhaps about the average for anything like mature and favorably situated trees 
specimens twenty-five feet in diameter are not rare and a good many approach a height of three hundred feet occasionally one meets a specimen thirty feet in diameter and rarely one that is larger the majestic stump on king's river is the largest i saw and measured on the entire trip careful search around the boundaries of the forests and groves and in the gaps of the belt failed to discover any trace of the former existence of the species beyond its present limits on the contrary it seems to be slightly extending its boundaries for the outstanding stragglers occasionally met a mile or two from the main bodies are young instead of old monumental trees ancient ruins and the ditches and root bowls the big trunks make in falling were found in all the groves but none outside of them we may therefore conclude that the area covered by the species has not been diminished during the last eight or ten thousand years and probably not at all in post-glacial times for admitting that upon those areas supposed to have been once covered by sequoia every tree may have fallen and that fire and the weather have left not a vestige of them many of the ditches made by the fall of the ponderous trunks weighing five hundred to nearly a thousand tons and the bowls made by their upturned roots would remain visible for thousands of years after the last remnants of the trees had vanished some of these records would doubtless be effaced in a comparatively short time by the inwashing of sediments but no inconsiderable part of them would remain enduringly engraved on the flat ridge tops almost wholly free from such action in the northern groves the only ones that at first came under the observation of students there are but few seedlings and young trees to take the places of the old ones therefore the species was regarded as doomed to speedy extinction as being only an expiring remnant vanquished in the so-called struggle for life and shoved into its last strongholds in moist glens where conditions are exceptionally favorable but the majestic continuous forests of the south end of the belt create a very different impression here as we have seen no tree in the forest is more enduringly established nevertheless it is oftentimes vaguely said that the sierra climate is drying out and that this oncoming constantly increasing drought will of itself surely extinguish king sequoia though sections of woodring show that there has been no appreciable change of climate during the last forty centuries furthermore that sequoia can grow and is growing on as dry ground as any of its neighbors or rivals we have seen proved over and over again why then it will be asked are the big tree groves always found on well-watered spots simply because big trees give rise to streams it is a mistake to suppose that the water is the cause of the groves being there on the contrary the groves are the cause of the water being there the roots of this immense tree fill the ground forming a sponge which hoards the bounty of the clouds and sends it forth in clear perennial streams instead of allowing it to rush headlong in short-lived destructive floods evaporation is also checked and the air kept still in the shady sequoia depths while thirsty robber winds are shut out since then it appears that sequoia can and does grow on as dry ground as its neighbors and that the greater moisture found with it is an effect rather than a cause of its presence the notions as to the former greater extension of the species and its near approach to extinction based on its supposed dependence on greater moisture are seen to be erroneous indeed all my observations go to show that in case of prolonged drought the sugar pines and firs would die before sequoia again if the restricted and irregular distribution of the species be interpreted as the result of the desiccation of the range then instead of increasing in individuals toward the south where the rainfall is less it should diminish if then its peculiar distribution has not been governed by superior conditions of soil and moisture by what has it been governed 
several years before i made this trip i noticed that the northern groves were located on those parts of the sierra soil belt that were first laid bare and opened to preemption when the ice sheet began to break up into individual glaciers and when i was examining the basin of the san joaquin and trying to account for the absence of sequoia when every condition seemed favorable for its growth it occurred to me that this remarkable gap in the belt is located in the channel of the great ancient glacier of the san joaquin and king's river basins which poured its frozen floods to the plain fed by the snows that fell on more than fifty miles of summit peaks of the range constantly brooding on the question i next perceived that the great gap in the belt to the northward forty miles wide between the stanislaus and the tulum groves occurs in the channel of the great stanislaus and tulum glacier and that the smaller gap between the merced and the mariposa groves occurs in the channel of the smaller merced glacier the wider the ancient glacier the wider the gap in the sequoia belt while the groves and forests attain their greatest development in the kawe and the tule river basins just where owing to topographical conditions the region was first cleared and warmed while protected from the main ice rivers that flowed past to right and left down the kings and kern valleys in general where the ground on the belt was first cleared of ice there the sequoia now is and where at the same elevation in time the ancient glaciers lingered there the sequoia is not what the other conditions may have been which enabled the sequoia to establish itself upon these oldest and warmest parts of the main soil belt i cannot say i might venture to state however that since the sequoia forests present a more and more ancient and long established aspect to the southward the species was probably distributed from the south toward the close of the glacial period before the arrival of other trees about this branch of the question however there is at present much fog but the general relationship we have pointed out between the distribution of the big trees and the ancient glacial system is clear and when we bear in mind that all the existing forests of the sierra are growing on comparatively fresh moraine soil and that the range itself has been recently sculptured and brought to light from beneath the ice mantle of the glacial winter then many lawless mysteries vanish and harmonies take their place but notwithstanding all the observed phenomena bearing on the post-glacial history of this colossal tree point to the conclusion that it never was more widely distributed on the sierra since the close of the glacial epoch that its present forests are scarcely past prime if indeed they have reached prime that the post-glacial day of the species is probably not half done yet when from a wider outlook the vast antiquity of the genus is considered and its ancient richness in species and individuals comparing our sierra giant and sequoia sempervirens of the coast the only other living species with the many fossil species already discovered and described by here and lescore some of which flourished over large areas around the arctic circle and in europe and our own territories during tertiary and cretaceous times then indeed it becomes plain that our two surviving species restricted to narrow belts within the limits of california are mere remnants of the genus both as to species and individuals and that they probably are verging to extinction but the verge of a period beginning in cretaceous times may have a breadth of tens of thousands of years not to mention the possible existence of conditions calculated to multiply and re-extend both species and individuals no unfavorable change of climate so far as i can see no disease but only fire and the axe and the ravages of flocks and herds threaten the existence of these noblest of god's trees in nature's keeping they are safe but through man's agency destruction is making rapid progress while in the work of protection only a beginning has been made the mariposa grove belongs to and is guarded by the state 
the general grant and sequoia national parks established ten years ago are efficiently guarded by a troop of cavalry under the direction of the secretary of the interior so also are the small tulum and merced groves which are included in the yosemite national park while a few scattered patches and fringes scarce at all protected though belonging to the national government are in the sierra forest reservation perhaps more than half of all the big trees have been sold and are now in the hands of speculators and mill men even the beautiful little calaveras grove of ninety trees so historically interesting from its being the first discovered is now owned together with the much larger south or stanislaus grove by a lumber company far the largest and most important section of the protected big trees is in the grand sequoia national park now easily accessible by stage from visalia it contains seven townships and extends across the whole breadth of the magnificent Cahuilla basin but large as it is it should be made much larger its natural eastern boundary is the high sierra and the northern and southern boundaries and the kings and kern rivers and thus including the sublime scenery on the headwaters of these rivers and perhaps nine-tenths of all the big trees in existence private claims cut and blotch both of the sequoia parks as well as all the best of the forests every one of which the government should gradually extinguish by purchase as it readily may for none of these holdings are of much value to their owners thus as far as possible the grand blunder of selling would be corrected the value of these forests in storing and dispensing the bounty of the mountain clouds is infinitely greater than lumber or sheep to the dwellers of the plain dependent on irrigation the big tree leaving all its higher uses out of the count is a tree of life a never-failing spring sending living water to the lowlands all through the hot rainless summer for every grove cut down a stream is dried up therefore all california is crying save the trees of the fountains nor judging by the signs of the times is it likely that the cry will cease until the salvation of all that is left of sequoia gigantia is sure End of chapter 9, section 20. Section 21 of Our National Parks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our National Parks by John Muir. Chapter 10, Part 1 the american forests the forests of america however slighted by man must have been a great delight to god for they were the best he ever planted the whole continent was a garden and from the beginning it seemed to be favored above all the other wild parks and gardens of the globe to prepare the ground it was rolled and sifted and seized with infinite loving deliberation and forethought lifted into the light submerged and warmed over and over again pressed and crumpled into folds and ridges mountains and hills subsoiled with heavy volcanic fires ploughed and ground and sculptured into scenery and soil with glaciers and rivers every feature growing and changing from beauty to beauty higher and higher and in the fullness of time it was planted in groves and belts and broad exuberant mantling forests with the largest most varied most fruitful and most beautiful trees in the world bright seas made its border with wave embroidery and icebergs gray deserts were outspread in the middle of it mossy tundras on the north savannas on the south and blooming prairies and plains while lakes and rivers shone through all the vast forests and openings and happy birds and beasts gave delightful animation everywhere everywhere over all the blessed continent there were beauty and melody and kindly wholesome foodful abundance these forests were composed of about five hundred species of trees all of them in some way useful to man ranging in size from twenty-five feet in height and less than one foot in diameter at the ground to four hundred feet in height and more than twenty feet in diameter 
lordly monarchs proclaiming the gospel of beauty like apostles for many a century after the ice plows were melted nature fed them and dressed them every day working like a man a loving devoted painstaking gardener fingering every leaf and flower and the mossy furrowed bowl bending trimming modeling balancing painting them with the loveliest colors bringing over them now clouds with cooling shadows and showers now sunshine fanning them with gentle winds and rustling their leaves exercising them in every fiber with storms and pruning them loading them with flowers and fruit loading them with snow and ever making them more beautiful as the years rolled by wide branching oak and elm in endless variety walnut and maple chestnut and beech ilex and locust touching limb to limb spread a leafy translucent canopy along the coast of the atlantic over the wrinkled folds and ridges of the alleghanies a green billowy sea in summer golden and purple in autumn pearly gray like a steadfast frozen mist of interlacing branches and sprays and leafless restful winter to the southward stretched dark level-topped cypresses and knobby tangled swamps grassy savannas in the midst of them like lakes of light groves of gay sparkling spice trees magnolias and palms glossy leaved and blooming and shining continually to the northward over maine and ottawa rose hosts of spiry rosiny evergreens white pine and spruce hemlock and cedar shoulder to shoulder laden with purple cones their myriad needles sparkling and shimmering covering hills and swamps rocky headlands and domes ever bravely aspiring and seeking the sky the ground in their shade now snow-cloud and frozen now mossy and flowery beaver meadows here and there full of lilies and grass lakes gleaming like eyes and a silvery embroidery of rivers and creeks watering and brightening all the vast glad wilderness thence westward were oak and elm hickory and tupelo gum and liriodendron sassafras and ash linden and laurel spreading on ever wider in glorious exuberance over the great fertile basin of the mississippi over damp level bottoms low dimpling hollows and round dotting hills embosoming sunny prairies and cheery park openings half sunshine half shade while a dark wilderness of pines covered the region around the great lakes then still westward swept the forest to right and left around grassy plains and deserts a thousand miles wide irrepressible hosts of spruce and pine aspen and willow nut pine and juniper cactus and yucca caring nothing for drought extending undaunted from mountain to mountain over mesa and desert to join the darkening multitudes of pines that covered the high rocky ranges and the glorious forests along the coast of the moist and balmy pacific where new species of pine giant cedars and spruces silver firs and sequoias kings of their race growing close together like grass in a meadow poised their brave domes and spires in the sky three hundred feet above the ferns and the lilies that enameled the ground towering serene through the long centuries preaching god's forestry fresh from heaven here the forests reached their highest development hence they went wavering northward over icy alaska brave spruce and fir poplar and birch by the coasts and the rivers to within sight of the arctic ocean american forests the glory of the world surveyed thus from the east to the west from the north to the south they are rich beyond thought immortal immeasurable enough and to spare for every feeding sheltering beast and bird insect and son of adam and nobody need have cared had there been no pines in norway no cedars and deodars on lebanon and the himalayas no vine-clad selvas in the basin of the amazon with such variety harmony and triumphant exuberance even nature it would seem must have rested content with the forests of north america and planted no more so they appeared a few centuries ago when they were rejoicing in wildness the indians with stone axes could do them no more harm than could gnawing beavers and browsing moose even the fires of the indians and the fierce shattering lightning seemed to work together only for good 
in clearing spots here and there for smooth garden prairies and openings for sunflowers seeking the light but when the steel axe of the white man rang out on the startled air their doom was sealed every tree heard the bodeful sound and pillars of smoke gave the sign in the sky i suppose we need not go mourning the buffaloes in the nature of things they had to give place to better cattle though the change might have been made without barbarous wickedness likewise many of nature's five hundred kinds of wild trees had to make way for orchards and cornfields in the settlement and civilization of the country bread more than timber or beauty was wanted and in the blindness of hunger the early settlers claiming heaven as their guide regarded god's trees as only a larger kind of pernicious weeds extremely hard to get rid of accordingly with no eye to the future these pious destroyers waged interminable forest wars ships flew thick and fast trees in their beauty fell crashing by millions smashed to confusion and the smoke of their burning has been rising to heaven more than two hundred years after the atlantic coast from maine to georgia had been mostly cleared and scorched into melancholy ruins the overflowing multitude of bread and money seekers poured over the alleghanies into the fertile middle west spreading ruthless devastation ever wider and farther over the rich valley of the mississippi in the vast shadowy pine region about the great lakes thence still westward the invading horde of destroyers called settlers made its fiery way over the broad rocky mountains felling and burning more fiercely than ever until at last it has reached the wild side of the continent and entered the last of the great aboriginal forests on the shores of the pacific surely then it should not be wondered at that lovers of their country bewailing its baldness are now crying aloud save what is left of the forest clearing has surely now gone far enough soon timber will be scarce and not a grove will be left to rest in or pray in the remnant protected will yield plenty of timber a perennial harvest for every right use without further diminution of its area it will continue to cover the springs of the rivers that rise in the mountains and give irrigating waters to the dry valleys at their feet prevent wasting floods and be a blessing to everybody forever every other civilized nation in the world has been compelled to care for its forests and so must we if waste and destruction are not to go on to the bitter end leaving america as barren as palestine or spain in its calmer moments in the midst of bewildering hunger and war and the restless over industry prussia has learned that the forest plays an important part in human progress and that the advance in civilization only makes it more indispensable it has therefore as shown by mr pinchot refused to deliver its forests to more or less speedy destruction by permitting them to pass into private ownership but the state woodlands are not allowed to lie idle on the contrary they are made to produce as much timber as is possible without spoiling them in the administration of its forests the state righteously considers itself bound to treat them as a trust for the nation as a whole and to keep in view the common good of the people for all time in france no government forests have been sold since eighteen seventy on the other hand about one half of the fifty million francs spent on forestry has been given to engineering works to make the replanting of denuded areas possible the disappearance of the forests in the first place it is claimed may be traced in most cases directly to mountain pasturage the provisions of the code concerning private woodlands are substantially these no private owner may clear his woodlands without giving notice to the government at least four months in advance and the forest service may forbid the clearing on the following grounds to maintain the soil on mountains to defend the soil against erosion and flooding by rivers or torrents to ensure the existence of springs or water courses to protect the dunes and seashore etc a proprietor who has cleared his forest without permission is subject to heavy fine and in addition may be made to replant the cleared area in switzerland after many laws like our own had been found wanting the swiss forest school was established in eighteen sixty five and soon after the federal forest law was enacted which is binding over nearly two-thirds of the country under its provisions 
the cantons must appoint and pay the number of suitably educated foresters required for the fulfillment of the forest law and in the organization of a normally stocked forest the object of first importance must be the cutting each year of an amount of timber equal to the total annual increase and no more the russian government passed a law in eighteen eighty eight declaring that clearing is forbidden in protected forests and is allowed in others only when its effects will not be to disturb the suitable relations which should exist between forest and agricultural lands even japan is ahead of us in the management of her forests they cover an area of about twenty nine million acres the feudal lords valued the woodlands and enacted vigorous protective laws and when in the latest civil war the mikado government destroyed the feudal system it declared the forest that had belonged to the feudal lords to be the property of the state promulgated a forest law binding on the whole kingdom and founded a school of forestry in tokyo the forest service does not rest satisfied with the present proportion of woodland but looks to planting the best forest trees it can find in any country if likely to be useful and to thrive in japan in india systematic forest management was begun about forty years ago under difficulties presented by the character of the country the prevalence of running fires opposition from lumbermen settlers etc not unlike those which confront us now of the total area of government forests perhaps seventy million acres fifty-five million acres have been brought under the control of the forestry department a larger area than that of all our national parks and reservations the chief aims of the administration are effective protection of the forest from fire an efficient system of regeneration and cheap transportation of the forest products the results so far have been most beneficial and encouraging it seems therefore that almost every civilized nation can give us a lesson on the management and care of forests so far our government has done nothing effective with its forests though the best in the world but is like a rich and foolish spendthrift who has inherited a magnificent estate in perfect order and then has left his fields and meadows forests and parks to be sold and plundered and wasted at will depending on their inexhaustible abundance now it is plain that the forests are not inexhaustible and that quick measures must be taken if ruin is to be avoided year by year the remnant is growing smaller before the axe and fire while the laws in existence provide neither for the protection of the timber from destruction nor for its use where it is most needed as is shown by mr e a bowers formerly inspector of the public land service the foundation of our protective policy which has never protected is an act passed march first eighteen seventeen which authorized the secretary of the navy to reserve lands producing live oak and cedar for the sole purpose of supplying timber for the navy of the united states an extension of this law by the passage of the act of march second eighteen thirty one provided that if any person should cut live oak or red cedar trees or other timber from the lands of the united states for any other purpose than the construction of the navy such person should pay a fine not less than triple the value of the timber cut and be imprisoned for a period not exceeding twelve months upon this old law as mr bowers points out having the construction of a wooden navy in view the united states government has to-day chiefly to rely on protecting its timber through the arid regions of the west where none of the naval timber which the law had in mind is to be found by the act of june third eighteen seventy eight timber can be taken from public lands not subject to entry under any existing laws except for minerals by bona fide residents of the rocky mountain states and territories and the dakotas under the timber and stone act of the same date land in the pacific states and nevada valuable mainly for timber and unfit for cultivation if the timber is removed can be purchased for two dollars and a half an acre under certain restrictions by the act of march third eighteen seventy five all land grant and right-of-way railroads are authorized to take timber from the public lands adjacent to their lines for construction purposes and they have taken it with a vengeance 
destroying a hundred times more than they have used, mostly by allowing fires to run in the woods. The settlement laws under which a settler may enter lands valuable for timber as well as for agriculture furnish another means of obtaining title to public timber. With the exception of the Timber Culture Act, under which, in consideration of planting a few acres of seedlings, settlers on the treeless plains got 160 acres each. The above is the only legislation aiming to protect and promote the planting of forests. In no other way than under some one of these laws can a citizen of the United States make any use of the public forests. To show the results of the Timber Planting Act, it need only be stated that of the 38 million acres entered under it, less than 1 million acres have been patented. This means that less than 50,000 acres have been planted with stunted, woebegone, almost hopeless sprouts of trees, while at the same time the government has allowed millions of acres of the grandest forest trees to be stolen or destroyed or sold for nothing. Under the Act of June 3, 1878, settlers in Colorado and the territories were allowed to cut timber for mining and educational purposes from mineral land, which in the practical West means both cutting and burning anywhere and everywhere for any purpose on any sort of public land. Thus the prospector, the miner, and mining and railroad companies are allowed by law to take all the timber they like for their mines and roads, and the forbidden settler if there are no mineral lands near his farm or stock ranch, or none that he knows of, can hardly be expected to forbear taking what he needs wherever he can find it. Timber is as necessary as bread, and no scheme of management failing to recognize and properly provide for this want can possibly be maintained. In any case, it will be hard to teach the pioneers that it is wrong to steal government timber, taking from the government is with them the same as taking from nature, and their consciences flinch no more in cutting timber from the wild forest than in drawing water from a lake or river. As for reservation and protection of forests, it seems as silly and needless to them as protection and reservation of the ocean would be, both appearing to be boundless and inexhaustible. The special land agents employed by the General Land Office to protect the public domain from timber depredations are supposed to collect testimony to sustain prosecution and to superintend such prosecution on behalf of the government, which is represented by the district attorneys. But timber thieves of the western class are seldom convicted, for the good reason that most of the jurors who try such cases are themselves as guilty as those on trial. The effect of the present confused, discriminating, and unjust system has been to place almost the whole population in opposition to the government, and as conclusive of its futility as shown by Mr. Bowers, we need only state that during the seven years from 1881 to 1887, inclusive, the value of the timber reported stolen from the government lands was $36,719,935, and the amount recovered was four hundred and seventy eight thousand seventy three dollars while the cost of the services of special agents alone was four hundred and fifty five thousand dollars to which must be added the expense of the trials thus for nearly thirty seven million dollars worth of timber the government got less than nothing and the value of that consumed by running fires during the same period without benefit even to thieves was probably over two hundred millions of dollars Land commissioners and secretaries of the interior have repeatedly called attention to this ruinous state of affairs and asked Congress to enact the requisite legislation for reasonable reform. But busied with tariffs, etc., Congress has given no heed to these or other appeals, and our forests, the most valuable and the most destructible of all the natural resources of the country, are being robbed and burned more rapidly than ever. The annual appropriation for so-called protection service is hardly sufficient to keep 25 timber agents in the field, and as far as any efficient protection of timber is concerned, these agents themselves might as well be timber. Footnote. A change for the better, compelled by public opinion, is now going on. 1901. End footnote. That a change from robbery and ruin to a permanent rational policy is urgently needed, 
nobody with the slightest knowledge of american forests will deny in the east and along the northern pacific coast where the rainfall is abundant comparatively few care keenly what becomes of the trees so long as fuel and lumber are not noticeably dear but in the rocky mountains and california and arizona where the forests are inflammable and where the fertility of the lowlands depends upon irrigation public opinion is growing stronger every year in favor of permanent protection by the federal government of all the forests that cover the sources of the streams even lumbermen in these regions long accustomed to steel are now willing and anxious to buy lumber for their mills under cover of law some possibly from a late second growth of honesty but most especially the small mill owners simply because it no longer pays to steal where all may not only steal but also destroy and in particular because it costs about as much to steal timber for one mill as for ten and therefore the ordinary lumberman can no longer compete with the large corporations many of the miners find that timber is already becoming scarce and dear on the denuded hills around their mills and they too are asking for protection of forests at least against fire these slow-going unthrifty farmers also are beginning to realize that when the timber is stripped from the mountains the irrigating streams dry up in summer and are destructive in winter that soil scenery and everything slips off with the trees so of course they are coming into the ranks of tree friends of all the magnificent coniferous forests around the great lakes once the property of the united states scarcely any belong to it now they have disappeared in lumber and smoke mostly smoke and the government got not one cent for them only the land they were growing on was considered valuable and two and a half dollars an acre was charged for it here and there in the southern states there are still considerable areas of timber government land but these are comparatively unimportant only the forests of the west are significant in size and value and these although still great are rapidly vanishing last summer of the unrivaled redwood forests of the pacific coast range the united states forestry commission could not find a single quarter section that remained in the hands of the government footnote the state of california recently appropriated two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to buy a block of redwood land near santa cruz for a state park a much larger national park should be made in humboldt or mendocino county End footnote. under the timber and stone act of eighteen seventy eight which might well have been called the dust and ashes act any citizen of the united states could take up one hundred and sixty acres of timberland and by paying two dollars and a half an acre for it obtain title there was some virtuous effort made with a view to limit the operations of the act by requiring that the purchaser should make affidavit that he was entering the land exclusively for his own use and by not allowing any association to enter more than one hundred and sixty acres nevertheless under this act wealthy corporations have fraudulently obtained title to from ten thousand to twenty thousand acres or more the plan was usually as follows a mill company desirous of getting title to a large body of redwood or sugar pine land first blurred the eyes and ears of the land agents and then hired men to enter the land they wanted and immediately deed it to the company after a nominal compliance with the law false swearing in the wilderness against the government being held of no account in one case which came under the observation of mr bowers was the practice of a lumber company to hire the entire crew of every vessel which might happen to touch at any port in the redwood belt to enter one hundred and sixty acres each and immediately deed the land to the company in consideration of the company's paying all expenses and giving the jolly sailors fifty dollars apiece for their trouble by such methods have our magnificent redwoods and much of the sugar pine forests of the sierra nevada been absorbed by foreign and resident capitalists uncle sam is not often called a fool in business matters yet he has sold millions of acres of timberland at two dollars and a half an acre on which a single tree was worth more than a hundred dollars but this priceless land has been patented and nothing can be done now but the crazy bargain according to the everlasting law of righteousness even the fraudulent buyers at less than one per cent of its value are making little or nothing on account of fierce competition 
the trees are felled and about half of each giant is left on the ground to be converted into smoke and ashes the better half is sawed into choice lumber and sold to citizens of the united states or to foreigners thus robbing the country of its glory and impoverishing it without right benefits to anybody a bad black business from beginning to end End of section 21section 22 of our national parks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org our national parks by john muir chapter 10 part 2 of the american forest the redwood is one of the few conifers that sprout from the stump and roots and it declares itself willing to begin immediately to repair the damage of the lumberman and also that of the forest burner as soon as a redwood is cut down or burned it sends up a crowd of eager hopeful shoots which if allowed to grow would in a few decades attain a height of a hundred feet and the strongest of them would finally become giants as great as the original tree gigantic second and third growth trees are found in the redwoods forming magnificent temple-like circles around charred ruins more than a thousand years old but not one denuded acre in a hundred is allowed to raise a new forest growth on the contrary all the brains religion and superstition of the neighborhood are brought into play to prevent a new growth the sprouts from the roots and stumps are cut off again and again with zealous concern as to be the best time and method of making death sure in the clearings of one of the largest mills on the coast we found thirty men at work last summer cutting off redwood shoots in the dark of the moon claiming that all the stumps and roots cleared out at this auspicious time would send up no more shoots anyhow these vigorous almost immortal trees are killed at last and black stumps are now their only monuments over most of the chopped and burned areas the redwood is the glory of the coast range it extends along the western slope in a nearly continuous belt about ten miles wide from beyond the oregon boundary to the south of santa cruz a distance of nearly four hundred miles and in massive sustained grandeur and closeness of growth surpasses all the other timber woods of the world trees from ten to fifteen feet in diameter and three hundred feet high are not uncommon and a few attain a height of three hundred and fifty feet or even four hundred with a diameter at the base of fifteen to twenty feet or more while the ground beneath them is a garden of fresh exuberant ferns lilies gaultheria and rhododendron this grand tree sequoia semperverans is surpassed in size only by its near relative sequoia gigantea or big tree of the sierra nevada if indeed it is surpassed the semperverans is certainly the taller of the two the gigantea attains a greater girth and is heavier more noble in port and more sublimely beautiful these two sequoia are all that are known to exist in the world though in former geological times the genus was common and had many species the redwood is restricted to the coast range and the big tree to the sierra as timber the redwood is too good to live the largest sawmills ever built are busy along its seaward border with all the modern improvements but so immense is the yield per acre it will be long ere the supply is exhausted the big tree is also to some extent being made into lumber it is far less abundant than the redwood and is fortunately less accessible extending along the western flank of the sierra in a partially interrupted belt about two hundred and fifty miles long at a height of from four to eight thousand feet above the sea the enormous logs too heavy to handle are blasted into manageable dimensions with gunpowder a large portion of the best timber is thus shattered and destroyed and with the huge knotty tops is left in ruins for tremendous fires that kill every tree within their range great and small still the species is not in danger of extinction it has been planted and is flourishing over a great part of europe and magnificent sections of the aboriginal forest have been reserved as national and state parks the mariposa sequoia grove near yosemite managed by the state of california and the general grant in sequoia national parks on the kings kawea 
and Toul rivers, efficiently guarded by a small troop of United States cavalry under the direction of the Secretary of the Interior. But there is not a single specimen of the redwood in any national park. Only by gift or purchase, so far as I know, can the government get back into its possession a single acre of this wonderful forest. The legitimate demands on the forest that have passed into private ownership, as well as those in the hands of the government, are increasing every year with the rapid settlement and upbuilding of the country, but the methods of lumbering are as yet grossly wasteful. In most mills only the best portions of the best trees are used, while the ruins are left on the ground to feed great fires, which kill much of what is left of the less desirable timber, together with the seedlings, on which the permanence of the forest depends. Thus every mill is a center of destruction far more severe from waste and fire than from use. The same is true of the mines, which consume and destroy indirectly immense quantities of timber with their innumerable fires, accidental or set to make open ways, and often without regard to how far they run. The prospector deliberately sets fires to clear off the woods just where they are densest, to lay the rocks bare and make the discovery of mines easier. Sheep owners and their shepherds also set fires everywhere through the woods in the fall to facilitate the march of their countless flocks the next summer, and perhaps in some places to improve the pasturage. The axe is not yet at the root of every tree, but the sheep is, or was before the national parks were established and guarded by the military, the only effective and reliable arm of the government, free from the blight of politics. Not only do the shepherds at the driest time of the year set fire to everything that will burn, but the sheep consume every green leaf, not sparing even the young conifers, where they are in a starving condition from crowding, and they rake and dribble the loose soil of the mountain sides for the spring floods to wash away, and thus at last leave the ground barren. Of all the destroyers that infest the woods, the shake-maker seems the happiest. Twenty or thirty years ago, shakes, a kind of long board-like shingles, split with a mallet and a frow, were in great demand for covering barns and sheds, and many are used still in preference to common shingles, especially those made from the sugar pine, which do not warp or crack in the hottest sunshine. Drifting adventurers in California, after harvest and threshing are over, oftentimes meet to discuss their plans for the winter, and their talk is interesting. Once in a company of this kind, I heard a man say, as he peacefully smoked his pipe, boys, as soon as this job's done, I'm going into the duck business. There's big money in it, and your grub costs nothing. Tool Joe made five hundred dollars last winter on Mallard and Teal, shot him on the Joaquin, tied him in dozens by the neck, and shipped him to San Francisco. And when he was tired waiting in the sloughs, in touch with rheumatiz, he just knocked off on ducks and went to the Contra Costa Hills for dove and quail. It's a mighty good business, and you're your own boss, and the whole thing's fun." Another of the company, a bushy-bearded fellow with a trace of brag in his voice, drawled out, "'Bird business is well enough for some, but bear is my game. With a deer and a California lion thrown in now and then for change, there's always market for bear grease, and sometimes you can sell the hams. They're good as hog hams any day. And you are your own boss in my business, too, if the bears ain't too big and too many for you. Old grizzlies I despise. They want cannon to kill them. But the blacks and browns are beauties for grease, and when once I get em just right and draw in a bead on em, I fetch em every time. Another said he was going to catch up a lot of mustangs as soon as the rain set in, hitch them to a gang plow, and go to farming on the San Joaquin plains for wheat. But most preferred the shake business, until something more profitable and as sure could be found, with equal comfort and independence. With a cheap mustang or mule to carry a pair of blankets, a sack of flour, a few pounds of coffee, and an axe, a frow, and a cross-cut saw, the shake-maker ascends the mountains to the pine belt where it is most accessible, usually by some mine or mill road. Then he strikes off into the virgin woods, where the sugar-pine, king of all the hundred species of pines in the world in size and beauty, towers on the open sunny slopes of the Sierra in the fullness of its glory. Selecting a favorable spot for a cabin near a meadow with a stream, he unpacks his animal and stakes it out on the meadow. Then he chops into one after another of the pines, until he finds one that he feels sure will split freely. Cuts this down, saws off a section four feet long, 
splits it, and from this first cut, perhaps seven feet in diameter, he gets shakes enough for a cabin and its furniture, walls, roof, door, bedstead, table, and stool. Besides his labor, only a few pounds of nails are required. Sapling poles form the frame of the airy building, usually about six feet by eight feet in size, on which the shakes are nailed, with the edges overlapping. A few bolts from the same section that the shakes were made from are split into square sticks and built up to form a chimney, the inside and interspaces being plastered and filled in with mud. Thus, with abundance of fuel, shelter, and comfort, by his own fireside are secured. Then he goes to work sawing and splitting for the market, tying the shakes in bundles of fifty or a hundred. They are four feet long, four inches wide, and about one-fourth of an inch thick. The first few thousands he sells or trades at the nearest mill or store, getting provisions in exchange. Then he advertises, in whatever way he can, that he has excellent sugar pond shakes for sale, easy of access and cheap. Only the lower, perfectly clear, free-splitting portions of the giant pines are used, perhaps ten to twenty feet from a tree two hundred and fifty in height. All the rest is left a mass of ruins, to rot or to feed the forest fires, while thousands are hacked deeply and rejected in proving the grain. Over nearly all the more accessible slopes of the Sierra and Cascade Mountains in southern Oregon, at a height from three to six thousand feet above the sea, and for a distance of about six hundred miles, this waste and confusion extends. Happy robbers, dwelling in the most beautiful woods, in the most salubrious climate, breathing delightful odors both day and night, drinking cool living water, roses and lilies at his feet in the spring, shedding fragrance and ringing bells as if cheering them on in their desolating work. There is none to say them nay. They buy no land, pay no taxes, dwell in a paradise with no forbidding angel either from Washington or from heaven. Every one of the frail shake shanties is the center of destruction, and the extent of the ravages wrought in this quiet way is in the aggregate enormous. It is not generally known that, notwithstanding the immense quantities of timber cut every year for foreign and home markets and mines, from five to ten times as much is destroyed as is used, chiefly by running forest fires that only the federal government can stop. Travelers through the West in summer are not likely to forget the firework displayed along the various railway tracks. Thoreau, when contemplating the destruction of the forests on the east side of the continent, said that soon the country would be so bald that every man would have to grow whiskers to hide its nakedness. But he thanked God that at least the sky was safe. Had he gone west, he would have found out that the sky was not safe, for all through the summer months, over most of the mountain regions, the smoke of mill and forest fires is so thick and black that no sunbeam can pierce it. The whole sky, with clouds, sun, moon, and stars, is simply blotted out. There is no real sky and no scenery. Not a mountain is left in the landscape, at least none is in sight from the lowlands, and they all might as well be on the moon as far as scenery is concerned. The half-dozen transcontinental railroad companies advertise the beauty of their lines in gorgeous, many-colored folders, each claiming its as the scenic route, the route of superior desolation, the smoke, dust, and ashes route, would be a more truthful description. Every train rolls on through dismal smoke and barbarous, melancholy ruins, and the companies might well cry in their advertisements, come travel our way. Ours is the blackest. It is the only genuine Erebus route. The sky is black and the ground is black, and on either side there is a continuous border of black stumps and logs and blasted trees, appealing to heaven for help, as if still half alive. And their mute eloquence is most interestingly touching. The blackness is perfect. On account of the superior skill of our workmen, advantages of climate and the kind of trees the charring is generally deeper along our line and the ashes are deeper and the confusion and desolation displayed can never be rivalled no other route on this continent so fully illustrates the abomination of desolation such a claim would be reasonable as each seems the worst whatever route you chance to take of course a way had to be cleared through the woods but the felled limber is not worked up into firewood for the engines and into lumber for the company's use. It is left lying in vulgar confusion, and is fired from time to time by sparks from locomotives, or by the workmen camping along the line. The fires, whether accidental or set, are allowed to run into the woods as far as they may, thus assuring comprehensive destruction. 
the directors of a line that guarded against fires and cleared a clean gap edged with living trees and fringed and mantled with the grass and flowers and beautiful seedling that are ever ready and willing to spring up might justly boast of the beauty of their road for nature is always ready to heal every scar but there is no such road on the western side of the continent last summer in the rocky mountains i saw six fires started by sparks from a locomotive within a distance of three miles and nobody was in sight to prevent them from spreading they might run into the adjacent forest and burn the timber for hundreds of square miles not a man in the state would care to spend an hour in fighting them as long as his own fences and buildings were not threatened notwithstanding all the waste and use which have been going on unchecked like a storm for more than two centuries it is not yet too late though it is high time for the government to begin a rational administration of its forests about seventy million acres it still owns enough for all the country if wisely used these residual forests are generally on mountain slopes just where they are doing the most good and where their removal would be followed by the greatest number of evils the lands they cover are too rocky and high for agriculture and can never be made as valuable for any other crop as for the present crop of trees it has been shown over and over again that if these mountains were to be stripped of their trees and underbrush and kept bare and sodless by hordes of sheep and the innumerable fires the shepherds set besides those of the millmen prospectors shake-makers and all sorts of adventurers both lowlands and mountains would speedily become little better than desert compared with their present beneficent fertility during heavy rainfalls and while the winter accumulations of snow were melting the large streams would swell into destructive torrents cutting deep rugged edged gullies carrying away the fertile humus and soil as well as sand and rocks filling up and overflowing their lower channels and covering the lowland fields with raw detritus drought and barrenness would follow in their natural condition or under wise management keeping out destructive sheep preventing fires selecting the trees that should be cut for lumber and preserving the young ones and the shrubs and sod of herbaceous vegetation these forests would be a never-failing fountain of wealth and beauty the cool shades of the forest give rise to moist beds and currents of air and the sod of grasses and the various flowering plants and shrubs thus fostered together with the network and sponge of tree roots absorb and hold back the rain and the waters from melting snow compelling them to ooze and percolate and flow gently through the soil and streams that never dry all the pine needles and rootlets and blades of grass and the fallen decaying trunks of trees are dams storing the bounty of the clouds and dispensing it in perennial life-giving streams instead of allowing it to gather suddenly and rush headlong in short-lived devastating floods everybody on the dry side of the continent is beginning to find this out and in view of the waste going on is growing more and more anxious for government protection the outcries we hear against forest reservations come mostly from thieves who are wealthy and steal timber by wholesale they have so long been allowed to steal and destroy in peace that any impediment to forest robbery is denounced as a cruel and irreligious interference with vested rights likely to endanger the repose of all ungodly welfare gold 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 how strong a voice that metal has oh why for the siller it is sigh prevailing even in congress a sizable chunk of gold carefully concealed will outtalk and outfight all the nation on a subject like forestry well smothered in ignorance and in which the money interests of only a few are conspicuously involved under these circumstances the brawling blethering oratorical stuff drowns the voice of god himself yet the dawn of a new day in forestry is breaking honest citizens see that only the rights of the government are being trampled not those of the settlers only what belongs to all alike is reserved and every acre that is left should be held together under the federal government as a basis for a general policy of administration for the public good the people will not always be deceived by selfish opposition whether from lumber and mining corporations or from sheepmen and prospectors however cunningly brought forward underneath fables and gold emerson says that things refuse to be mismanaged along an exception would seem to be found in the case of our forests which have been mismanaged rather long and now come desperately near being like smashed eggs and spilt milk still in the long run the world does not move backward 
the wonderful events made in the last few years in creating four national parks in the west and thirty forest reservations embracing nearly forty million acres and in the planting of the borders of streets and highways and spacious parks in all the great cities to satisfy the natural taste and hunger for landscape beauty and righteousness that god has put in some measure into every human being and animal shows the trend of awakening public opinion the making of the far-famed new york central park was opposed by even good men with misguided pluck perseverance and ingenuity but straight right won its way and now that park is appreciated so we confidently believe it will be with our great national parks and forest reservations there will be a period of indifference on the part of the rich sleepy with wealth and of the toiling millions sleepy with poverty most of whom never saw a forest a period of screaming protest and objection from the plunderers who are as unconscionable and enterprising as satan but light is surely coming and the friends of destruction will preach and bewail in vain the united states government has always been proud of the welcome it has extended to good men of every nation seeking freedom and homes and bread let them be welcomed still as nature welcomes them to the woods as well as to the prairies and plains no place is too good for good men and still there is room they are invited to heaven and may well be allowed in america every place is made better by them let them be as free to pick gold and gems from the hills to cut and hew dig and plant for homes and bread as the birds are to pick berries from the wild bushes and moss and leaves for nests the ground will be glad to feed them and the pines will come down from the mountains for their homes as willingly as the cedars came from lebanon for solomon's temple nor will the woods be the worse for this use or their benign influences be diminished any more than the sun is diminished by shining mere destroyers however tree killers wool and mutton men spreading death and confusion in the fairest groves and gardens ever planted let the government hasten to cast them out and make an end of them for it must be told again and again and be burningly borne in mind that just now while protective measures are being deliberated languidly destruction and use are speeding on faster and farther every day the axe and saw are insanely busy chips are flying thick as snowflakes and every summer thousands of acres of priceless forests with their underbrush soil springs climate scenery and religion are vanishing away in clouds of smoke while except in the national parks not one forest guard is employed all sorts of local laws and regulations have been tried and found wanting and the costly lessons of our own experience as well as that of every civilized nation show conclusively that the fate of the remnant of our forest is in the hands of the federal government and that if the remnant is to be saved at all it must be saved quickly any fool can destroy trees they cannot run away and if they could they would still be destroyed chased and hunted down as long as fun or a dollar could be got out of their bark hides branching horns or magnificent bold backbones few that fell trees plant them nor would planting avail much towards getting back anything like the noble primeval forest during a man's life only saplings can be grown in place of the old trees tens of century old that have been destroyed it took more than three thousand years to make some of the trees in these western woods trees that are still standing in perfect strength and beauty waving and singing in the mighty forests of the sierra through all the wonderful eventful centuries since christ's time and long before that god has cared for these trees saved them from drought disease avalanches and a thousand straining leveling tempests and floods but he cannot save them from fools only uncle sam can do that end of section twenty two end of our national parks by john muir